joining us. We had a lot of registration, so we got a good audience out there today. Uh, appreciate you all joining us. This is uh, Wilmick's 10th year now of doing half-day summer seminars. Uh, so this is uh, this has proven to be a popular uh, time of year and a popular program. So thanks for joining us. I wish we could be in person, but obviously uh, the world as we know it dictates that we do this by video and uh, uh, we, uh, we are happy to be able to continue to bring these to you uh, via this forum. Uh, we have a good program today. We are going to spend the first hour and 15 minutes talking about family law issues, um, and particularly as the pandemic has impacted uh, the family law practice. Uh, and we have Greg Herman with us, uh, Milwaukee family law attorney. Uh, Greg is well known uh, around the state, uh, both through bar activities and, and his work uh, in the family law area. Um, we also have our two claims attorneys with us, uh, Matt Beyer. Uh, Will Mc claims attorney is here, and Brian Anderson, Will Mc senior claims attorney. Um, they will bring us the perspective of what they see uh, when claims come up, and and even potential claims when it when it's short of a claim, but it's a kind of a, a maybe a case that has gone a little sideways. And so um, we'll get their perspective as well. Um, just a couple of things to let you know: there will be uh, you, you should see as you look at your screen in your upper right corner. Uh, a button called Ask the Speakers. If you click on that button, you'll get a text box. You can type in a comment or a question and it'll come right to me and uh, and we'll have the speakers address that for you. So do not hesitate. Um, you don't have to wait for the end for a Q&A session or anything like that. Um, just uh, when a question or comment comes to mind and you wanna jump in on the conversation, um, feel free to submit your question or comment through that button. Again, it's called Ask the Speakers. You should see it in the upper right. Um, also, there's a link on your screen that says handouts. You should be able to access all the handouts that the speakers have provided for this program. Um, we've discovered this morning that uh, that link wasn't working. Um, and so if that is still the case, that we, have our, uh, we have our video production people working on it. Um, so you may click on it and find that it's not letting you in. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, if that's true, um, hang with us. Uh, hopefully we'll get that link squared away momentarily. As I said, they're working on it now. So uh, hopefully we'll get that going and you should have access to the handout. So uh, with that, let's get started. Um, in addition to Greg, uh, we have Bill Williams uh, with us as well. Bill is an estate planning lawyer in Madison and Bill will be with us during the second half of the program. Uh, we'll take a break at 1015 after the family law session. And then at 1030, we'll resume with the estate planning session that'll go till noon and Bill will be on uh, to uh, give us his uh, observations and, and some insight into what he has seen in the estate planning area uh, over the past year and a half and, and what might be lurking ahead for us uh, as we move forward and hopefully emerge out of this pandemic uh, at some point soon. The uh, surge of cases certainly is a bit discouraging, but hopefully we'll, we'll get there. So uh, without any further ado, um, Matt, Brian, and Greg, welcome, and thank you for being part of the program today. Really appreciate it. Greg, um, you have practiced family law for uh, probably longer like than you. you. <laughs> a long time, how about that? Uh, and uh, a few decades, I guess. Um, and uh, this is probably uh, a time that it's nothing like we've ever seen. Uh, I, I suspect in your career, this, there's some unique things that you, you know, you'd, you'd, you're in a position where you'd probably say, you know, I've seen it all, but <laughs> I guess we haven't, right? We're seeing some, some interesting things going on out there. Yeah, it sure has. And I'm, I'm going to touch briefly on a few things in my outline. And maybe one thing of a once over of some of the issues that have changed significantly um, as a result of, of the pandemic. Um, the part I'm gonna have a real hard time on Tom is trying to predict what happens from here. Um, nobody predicted this pandemic's gonna happen. So I don't know how anybody can predict uh, what's gonna happen next week or next month. Or to quote my favorite uh, philosopher, um, Yogi Berra, who said, predictions are very difficult to make, especially about the future. <laughs> so I'm not going to make any predictions of uh, easy predict the past. Future is another thing. 
Uh, but some of these issues you said, and I've been doing this for 30 some years, never come up before. And uh, so I'm gonna touch on three or four of them. And then we can uh, uh, let Matt and Brian jump in and see what uh, questions other people have. Uh, the one is probably, um, I don't have a lot of anecdotal evidence about it, is what happens with the decisions with the parents that are affected by the pandemic, and particularly um, in terms of uh, ending school live or virtual. Um, there's obviously no appellate case law or anything like that on it, because the time it takes for review would exceed the school year. So there's Thing that happens, and in terms of the courts considering the evidence, given the difficulty of getting into courts, um, it's uh, there's not a lot of except that um, um, uh, courts <laughs> encourage people very much. It's a great area for mediation to try and tell the parents. That what worries me in terms of the future on this is that at some point, I think within the next few months, the vaccine, I would guess, is going to become available for children under 12 years old. And I'm going to guess that there are certain divorced parents, whether or not um, children should get vaccinated. Um, uh, this is going to play off is that courts are going to be in since that's the majority of the medical evidence in this. Uh, remember two things in terms of the law. The first is parents are not required under the statute to agree. Uh, our joint custody statute says each parent has an individual, which means it's very conceivable a parent could proceed in getting a, um, uh, a children vaccinated without the other, once that's done, it's too late to do anything about that. So the, um, uh, uh, and also just getting, uh, uh, getting in the court would be difficult. The judge does not make the decision. The court would assign a parent as the decision maker in the case or, or designate a parent as the decision maker. And again, there, it's interesting is that there isn't a lot of anecdotal evidence on that uh, on this as of yet, other than what from what I've heard courts are doing is telling people go to mediation, talk to your doctor and work this out between what I've been able to do. And I think it's um, what worries me is in terms of what happens when these vaccines are eligible for younger children. And um, it's something we're just gonna have to see that it plays out. Um, the support modification issue, I touched on in our outline, and I just wanna to touch on that briefly again, because it's a true pendulum swing. Uh, in family law, courts are not required to use a parent's actual income in terms of setting support, either the child support or maintenance, but can use the parent's income ability if the court feels that under the circumstance. And we've seen this huge pendulum swing. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, when uh, unemployment was low, it was, uh, courts were looking very, very much would come in and say, gee, I'm, uh, I'm not earning as much as I was, or I don't have a job, or I'm not earning at all for any reason. Then the pendulum swings totally the other way. When unemployment shoots up, everybody uh, all of a sudden it becomes almost the norm that people are out of work. And now we have the pendulum swinging back uh, and it overswung where we are where jobs are incredibly plentiful. They may not be high level jobs, some of them are, but at least there, there are jobs out there. And it changes <clears throat> the perspective of somebody coming into court um, and saying that I'm not um, earning as much as I was before, or even I'm not earning at all. Um, and um, uh, they, they have to hey, hey, Greg. Lawyers, they have to, hey, hey, Greg. Hey, yeah. Greg. And let me interrupt you. Um, you're you're breaking up. You're you're going in and out and freezing up. Um, it's difficult to hear you. Um, do you want to? Uh, I don't know. Maybe uh, maybe log off and log back on again, and and we'll see if we do better. Or would it be easier to, to dial in? Do you uh, on a phone? 
that might help. Uh, I don't know, Phil, is that? Uh, yes, that will get us a good signal. We may not see them, but we'll hear them much better. Hold on, please. Okay. Uh, in the meantime, uh, I'll uh, I'll swing it over to Matt and Brian. Uh, Greg raised a bunch of issues. Um, you know, uh, uh, child that? support. I need the dial-in number. I'm sorry. Phil, you got that? Yep. Give me a second, and I'll chat it to you privately, Greg. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Greg, in the meantime, we'll get back to you as soon as you're you're hooked back up. Uh, Matt and Brian, I know you've probably seen some of the issues that Greg has raised uh in in family law matters um talk about some of the issues that that are have been problematic for for attorneys who have contacted you guys yeah you know tom i, I think it's uh it's important to note uh, and and greg hit on it uh, at the very beginning and that is that we're dealing with very novel issues here um you know and, and you did too you know the the pandemic itself is presenting uh, many new things to consider uh, in a court system that's not necessarily equipped to handle family law issues perfectly, um, or sometimes even well. Uh, we now have things like uh, vaccinations and mask mandates um, and, and other, you know, participation in extracurricular activities, all of these things that impact the family uh, and our very personal decisions, um, you know, end up uh, at some point in court um, and uh, both sides argue um, and very emotionally. Uh, and what we're seeing, I think, uh, is, is an uptick uh, in upset. Um, all one has to do really is turn on the news, you know, to see that, you know, the mask mandate, this little, you know, thing that weighs half an ounce uh, is creating a lot of problem, you know, in, as part of the human condition. Um, so, you know, when those sort of emotions bubble up and, and, and become problematic, uh, you know, I, I think uh, family law attorneys and courts and uh, all of the parties need to figure out ways to navigate those situations. Uh, and we're seeing some of that. Um, I know that Brian is a, is a big numbers man. And, uh, you know, one of the part of the materials that we've included, uh, you know, demonstrate that, you know, these issues are starting to bubble up and they are starting to give rise to claims and grievances. Um, and so, Brian, what are you seeing numbers wise, you know, uh, as far as uh, recent numbers uh, and uh, yeah. relevant to the pandemic? Well, Tom, uh, either we were lucky or we were smart with regard to the two areas for the program today, because number one and two for 2021, number one is the state trust probate. 26% <clears throat> of the new claims that we've seen this year are in that area. And family law is number two with 18%. And if you add those two together, that's 40, 44% of the claims. Can we track uh, a little feedback going on there? Greg, you want to mute your... There you go. Is that better? Can you do that? Everybody mutes your microphone. I'm used... That is not, that is not, that is not an improvement. All right, guys. Why don't you hang that up? All right. Greg, down on the bottom where your microphone button is, where you can mute yourself and unmute, there's a little arrow. If you click there, there's an option to switch to phone audio. Walk through that process, and I think it fixes the problem. Instead of okay. dialing in direct from the numbers I sent. All right, we, uh, so anyway, the- Go ahead, Brian. Yeah, go ahead. The, the point being that, uh, well, 44%, we track, uh, oh, I think, well, well over 20 areas of law. So for, two, for the two areas that we're talking about today to be almost half of the claims, it, it warranted a program. And that's why, Tom, I know when we were kicking around ideas about what, what our- what area of concern might we want to focus on? These two stood out for good reason because they're having the most claim activity. Um, and I think Greg, obviously Greg, I think Greg raised a good point. We don't know, you know, you hate to put the cart before the horse or make big assumptions when we're unfortunately still maybe in the early stages of this pandemic. I don't know where it all goes, but it's it's having an impact on the numbers. Uh, and 
And uh, maybe some of the things, and I, I, I looked through the claims I drilled down to try to see if there are any trends. And um, the COVID area maybe kicked in a little more obviously in the estate trust probate claims that we've seen this year. In terms of family law, fee issues, which we'll talk about, continue to create claim uh, problems. But one, one area, Greg, that maybe a, be curious what you might say about it is we're seeing some real after the fact second guessing and i think maybe due to economic stresses or otherwise whereby uh, there may be a real change in assets and i think real estate stands out where down the road uh, a division was made in property or, or in a family law case and we've seen some incredible real estate jumps in terms of one might sell a home for well over what they even expected or yeah, obviously anticipated the time of the, of the divorce. And I think that's a, I guess, I guess I'd kick that back to Greg, assuming he can you know? hear us now, but. Um, I can, I can yeah, hear I, you guys. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. Okay. So, Greg, uh, one, um, one thing that, that concerns me is that you do it, you do it, uh, you, know, you, you work a division that looks very unfair a year from now, but. No one anticipated these type of uh, gains in the real estate market. For, it stands out to me. And that just puts the uh, family law practitioner at peril for a claim. Sure. Um, let me, um, uh, interestingly, I had, I was uh, mediating a divorce yesterday and uh, that issue came up uh, and I'll tell you how we handled it. The, um, uh, the, the issue is that uh, uh, particularly in terms of real estate, because as Tom mentioned, I've been doing this for years and I've seen hot real estate markets before, but I've never seen anything like this. It's just, it's just insane. And um, the problem you have is if you, uh, get, if you do get an appraisal, appraisals are based upon comps, which are based upon some property that's sold um, at uh, within the last, uh, usually six months to a year. Well, a sale six months to a year, there's little, resemblance uh, to what actual value is today. And um, uh, even if you do get the appraisal, uh, generally you get it several months before the divorce. And it used to be, okay, big deal. So, you know, you get a few months before what, what's, you know, what's the big problem. And in this market uh, where prices are just going insane, um, an appraisal from two or three months before may be uh, antiquated. Uh, the way we handled it yesterday, and I'm going to, I just want to preface it by saying it's not a perfect solution, but um, most of, a lot of things in, in family law, for that matter, in life aren't perfect solutions. Um, the way we handled it is what's, what's called a clawback provision. And a clawback provision works as follows. Uh, say the appraisals just make up a number, say it was came in at $200,000. And let's say that the wife's being awarded the house and the husband says, yeah, 200,000 then, today, tomorrow, next week, she could turn around and sell that and she might sell for 50,000. That's how crazy the market is. Yeah. Clawback provision says within a certain specified period of time, and you don't wanna to go too far out on this. So sometimes six months, uh, yesterday, the parties agreed to one year that if the party being awarded the house sells it for more than the appraised value, that she will pay half that additional amount to the other party, less um, uh, half the commission. You know, cost of sale, uh, that should all be the same. You know, any other costs associated with it be taken off. Um, the downside, of course, is that the um, anytime you put in a provision of what you're going to do later, you run the risk that somebody's going to disagree with how it plays out, disagrees with your arithmetic, start a fight on it. But it was perfect perfectly acceptable in my mediation today to the party getting the house because, you know, she just figured um, yeah, that's not a problem. I just wouldn't sell it for a year and a half at the best, in which case the clawback provision no longer apply. It's fine him because his main concern was that $200,000 appraisal was ridiculously low and she'll turn around and pocket the extra, pocket the extra 50000 So he figured, okay, if it goes down the line, I can live with that. So it's not a perfect solution, but I've used clawback provisions before. They were rare. I think we're going to be seeing more of them now. And I think that they would answer a question 
of okay, use an appraised value at, as the starting point. But if somebody's expecting the profit quickly from that, that profit will be shared with the other side. Yeah, it, Brian, uh, you, I suppose that still could be a, a source of of a, of a of a claim targeted at an attorney. Cool. I, I like the idea, and certainly that would be an. Obviously, you'd want. Well, Greg, you were in the role of the mediator there, but um, yes. both sides would definitely want to have a letter to their client explaining the pros cons and what and that they're what they decided to do, and they're on agreement. Where I could see a potential claim issue would be if one side's not represented, and then feels that uh, maybe that you weren't looking out for their interest, or, or were you representing their interest if they weren't your client? That those those the conflict thing is still out there in the family law area too. I'm looking back at my I'm looking at my list again from 2021, whereby the either if one side's not represented. We have this idea, and or if, if an, uh, an attorney tries to w broker a deal in the best interest of both sides, just make sure that it's well documented as to who you represent, who you don't represent, and uh, that they're advised to get an attorney to review. Um, I'm sure, Greg, the case you're talking about, both sides had counsel, I am assuming. Yeah. Yeah. So the, yeah. probably not yeah. as much of a, of a concern there, but. You know, I'm not as a mediator. I'm not the, uh, in terms of the parties, but in, 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 I agree with you, Brian. It's a matter of explaining the parties. Hey, here are your options. You know, used to get an appraisal, and that's the value. Um, it's just no longer. That's I think a worse option than than uh, the uh, the other one, which is sell the house if somebody doesn't yeah. want to sell the house, especially if there are uh, minor children in it. Um, so you know, you look for some other option, and in terms of the claims issue again it's explaining to the client the biggest risk in it is that anytime as i said anytime you say something's going to happen in the future you run the risk of somebody either yeah. not doing it or not doing it the way the other yeah. party thinks they should but it's a matter of weighing that risk against the others and as long as you explain to your client um you know the other option is either sell the house if you don't you know what to do that or use the appraised option yeah, and, and Tom, just the final piece on that is when, when they're at least an appraisal, if you have an appraisal, you've taken the steps on behalf of your client to get an independent third party analysis regarding the value of the property and you have something in your file. What concerns me is if you if you decide not to have an appraisal, if the client says, no, I don't want to spend a very small amount of money for an appraisal, which could swing the value of an estate by six figures one way or the other, that's a hard one to explain later down the road when at a deposition, the attorney says, well, how much would an appraisal have cost? I, I'm making up a number, $300, $500. And the the effect on your client was $270,000. It's about three so or four hundred. Yeah. Yeah. No, you're right. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I think what we're uh, sort of dancing around here are, you know, the elements of, of a malpractice claim, right? And, and talking specifically about what duty is owed by the lawyer to the client. Uh, and I, I like what what Greg's response was, which was, you know, a, a lawyer's job isn't, you know, <laughs> the Yogi Berra type prediction, you know, especially when it involves things in the future. But the lawyer's job, I think, is to communicate with the client, you know, the options that are available, because ultimately, you know, those kinds of decisions are left to the client. And, and it is uh, important for the attorney to to identify what all of those options are with, with, the, lawyer, with the best information they have at that time. Exactly, exactly right. And I think that, you know, in a mediation, you know, that can get messy. Uh, you know, there are a lot of conversations that are had there, you know, there isn't, you know, what we refer to as a as an IAY letter, an I advised you letter, um, which I think, you know, for, for the attorney, I think it's very important, you know, post mediation uh, to to memo the file, or better yet, you know, write that IAY letter, you know, this is what happened at mediation. These are the options we considered. And ultimately, you know, obviously, if it results in a settlement agreement, you know, the decision is obvious, um, you know, but this is what I did. And this is what you did, client, um, you know, I, I think is an important uh, step to take in your practice to make sure that you are you are doing what you're supposed to be doing. And you, you demonstrate that you've met your duty to the client. 
Yeah, it's a <clears throat> man, good point, man. It's the, the total balancing act or the teeter totter is, hey, it's the client's call. I'm just their counselor. The client's decision, I abide by that decision. However, as the attorney, you have to advise the client in such a manner so that they understand the pros and cons and are able to make an informed decision. So you do, although it is the client's case, the client's call, you as an attorney have to put them in the position whereby they make an informed decision. And that uh, was laid out, I think, Mandy, that's laid out in our outline um, pretty well, but it's um, it's the it's the classic balancing act where you say, well, it was the client's call, but did you put them in position so they made the correct call? And if so, make sure you paper it, especially when they're not following your advice that although I advised you of X, Y, and Z, you decided to do a different angle and that's their decision, but make sure that they've, you've made that decision, they made that decision with an informed uh, sense of pros and cons of what, what they decided to do. Yeah. Greg, are you finding that uh, is, is asset valuation one of the biggest issues going on right now? I, I guess I was thinking, you know, vaccines and yeah, other kids should go to school and that sort of stuff, but but asset valuation certainly is there too. Yeah, it, mostly it's the real estate ones that are driving people crazy, like we're talking about. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, in terms of other asset valuations, I mean, the stock market was down, it's better than normal. It's sort of normal. Um, in terms of uh, business value, Situations um, that's always been all up, and those, those appraisals have always been something that, um, um, how do we put this, um, involve a lot of artwork rather than uh, sometimes more artwork than science anyway. And um, other than certain specific businesses, um, I don't see it affected. The, the main one one is, um, um, is real estate values. Those are the ones that have been so um, changeable uh, in ways that were totally unpredictable and then nobody is sure headed for it in terms of that either. Most of the farms are going to uh, normalize over the next few months. But as I said earlier, uh, nobody predicted this is going to happen. Um, I want to, can I bring up another area though that it, it, um, I was going to mention getting in my summary that in terms of claims protection, um, I think is critically important in this area. And it's one that um, I think COVID has a major effect upon. Um, which is the area of uh, prenuptial limits, something I think Bill Williams may uh, have some familiarity with an area that he may want to address in the second half of this program. But um, Wisconsin has a provision that's uh, fairly unusual. I, I think there's only one or two other states that have a provision in terms of premarital agreements. Um, every state has a requirement that in addition to um, uh, uh, putting into uh, uh, that the agreements uh, have parties should have lawyers should have financial disclosure uh, and that the agreement be uh, reasonably fair to the parties at the time uh, that they signed the agreement. Wisconsin is rather unusual in that we have what's known as a second look provision. The second look provision means not only does the agreement have to be fair at the time the parties entered into it, whatever fair means. It does not mean it has to be the same as if they got a divorce. Otherwise, why have an agreement? So it's a rather vague term anyway. But in addition to that term being vague at the time of the agreement, the second look provision says that if circumstances have changed at the time of the divorce, if the agreement is no longer fair, that the agreement can be rejected by the court on that basis. And there have been a number of cases within the past couple of years, uh, some of them uh, reported, some of them unreported, where courts have re rejected agreements based upon the fact that, hey, this might have been fair at the time of the divorce, but things are very different now. And this is where COVID, I think, is going to make a major change in this, because if you're dealing with parties that signed an agreement 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago, the statute of limitations probably, and I'm using the word probably because I don't believe there's any express case law on this, but probably starts at the time of discovery, not at the time that the parties signed the agreement. So if you have parties who signed a premarital agreement 15 years ago, and due to COVID, the financial circumstances have changed significantly in some form, the court can reject the agreement 
on the basis that it may have been fair back then, but things have changed and it's no longer fair now. It's what's called the second look provision. And there is, um, and I happen to know several cases like this now, where the party wanted the agreement enforced said, my lawyer never told me about this. My lawyer never explained that this thing has to be, uh, uh, could could be rejected at some unknown point in the birth. And if I'm correct that the statute of limitations starts at the time of discovery, which could be 10, 15, 20 years later, it's a very scary proposition in terms of this. One of the, the quote, solutions that's been said for this is that the party should revisit their premarital agreement um, every five or 10 years. And that's one of those solutions that I believe Eve sounds better in theory than in life. And the reason is, is um, I don't know about anybody else. Um, I can guarantee you any conversation that I would ever have with my wife that would start with the words, let's discuss what happens if we get divorced, would not have a happy end to it. <laughs> so the, the theory that, oh, yeah, let's just sit down and have this nice, happy decision about what do we do if we get divorced and we do the agreement, you know, it sounds well in theory. In real life, parties aren't going to want to do that. And if they do that, that it may not be happy. And it's a, a major area currently in terms of malpractice. And it's one that I'm going to be a much more developing one because of these incredible changes in financial circumstances that nobody foresaw. Although, Greg, they, they entered a premarital agreement in the first place. So I guess they were certainly looking ahead to the possibility that something could go wrong in the marriage, right? But in the marriage, yes. Yes, Tom. But it's the finance it out at the time of the um, uh, of, that they got married could go in either direction. And I've seen where somebody, and a, a given example, signed a prenup with what are called a step. We're married so many years, I'll pay you X, Y dollars, uh, Y dollars after 10 years, Z, you know, and stepped it up based upon the length of the marriage. Well, that sounds really good because the theory is, is he's going to be worth more and therefore we'll pay her more. Well, what if he's worth less? And the... So the step theory sounds like a protection, but that may actually work to the detriment of the party trying to protect his or her assets. Um, and if you don't put in some sort of a step and just say, hey, and what most prenups say is everybody just gets their property back uh, that they brought into the marriage along with any appreciation or whatever. Again, that sounds really good. But what if at the time of the uh, now the, the net worth has increased tenfold, twentyfold, or any other number of circumstances that it could make what made sense 10 or 15, 20 years ago, no longer makes sense today. And, and with COVID, which has had talked about asset valuation times, it, it's gone both ways. I mean, certainly if you're in um, a, a travel business, a business value probably went down very significantly if you're in a service business. There are other types of businesses which have uh, done extremely well. I had a client who was in a bit, um, manufactures ammunition and um, they've just done spectacularly as a result of COVID. That's a really, really good business to be in. So my point is when you draft these prenups, it's, e it's, not, it's easy to say, okay, this makes sense under today's circumstances. Gonna face, the lawyer's going to face the potential risk of COVID or something like COVID happening in the future. And what made sense then no longer makes sense now. You face the risk of the client blaming you for uh, drafting an agreement that wasn't upheld. Of course, it could have very significant financial ramifications either way. Yeah. So I guess, Brian and Matt, from the perspective of risk management, I guess, and this is nothing new, I suppose, but when, when lawyers are representing someone who's signing a prenup or, or any kind of contractual agreement that could have implications years later, it's important to note to the client that this is not airtight, um, that, that you know, um, it, it could be the subject of uh, some dispute uh, down the road so that they know that. Um, because some people are probably under the impression, as, as Greg, as you're sort of outlining, you, you sign the prenup, you think you're, you're protected. And, 
15 years later, you find out maybe you weren't. Yeah, I, I think we should talk about at least two things. Um, one, let me just take a step back and, and clarify the, the statute of limitations issue. Uh, as we point out in the outline, <clears throat> uh, the statute of limitations in, for malpractice claims uh, that sound in tort uh, changed from six years to three years. That happened in, uh, I think, April of 2018. Um, so the statute of limitations as it's written in the statute is three years. Uh, however, Greg's absolutely right that the discovery rule applies to legal malpractice claims. Um, and I, I don't uh, recall seeing, uh, you know, uh, the answer to his question, although I think his suggestion that the discovery rule would apply to the very situation he described. Um, but there is a case out there called uh, Bleeker v. Cahill, um, and I don't have the site right in front of me. Uh, but it talks about the discovery rule in a real estate context. Uh, and uh, the, the court opined that, you know, the, the statute of limitations uh, at that time, it was six years, didn't start to run until uh, the client discovered the injury. Uh, and I think that's what Greg is getting at, that this is really a, one of those pitfalls that you need to figure out a way to avoid. Uh, because, again, 10, 15, 20 years down the road, and Wilmick has those claims. Um, where they were made, you know, 20 years or at least a couple decades um, after uh, the legal work was done, um, but uh, were still viable because uh, they were discovered at a later date, and that's when the clock started ticking. Um, so that is a real issue. Uh, this is a real uh, problem, um, you know, that that one needs to take some steps to avoid. And so uh, the other item that I would, or the other piece that I would talk about is, you know, how can you avoid that? Well, um, if you take a look at, um, and Brian alluded to this, you know, how does a client make an informed decision? Um, you know, and uh, it, it may or may not apply specifically in each and every situation, but the definition of informed consent uh, in the rules of professional conduct uh, is found in uh, 20 colon 1.0 sub F. And it says, it says this, uh, the agreement by a client to a proposed course of conduct after a lawyer has communicated adequate information and explanation about the material risks of and reasonably available alternatives to the proposed course of conduct. So there's a whole lot of gray area in there. Um, but I think the, the important takeaways are, you know, one, you need to have the communication with your client prior to the client making the decision uh, about how exactly uh, to address, you know, a prenuptial agreement. Um, and, and second, it has to be thorough enough and, so that it, it does include uh, some instruction, you know, that Wisconsin has this weird uh, look back uh, provision um, that, that must be met, um, you know, at the time that any party decides to try and enforce the prenuptial agreement. Um, and then, uh, you know, is it, do they have enough alternatives to consider to be able to make that informed decision that Brian was talking about uh, so that you have met your, your ethical responsibilities to your client and you've done a good job of lawyering? So I think, yeah, I think Greg is spot on. He identified an issue uh, and there are ways, uh, you know, and especially by way of papering your file with letters to the client uh, with, with adequate communication uh, to try and avoid those. Yeah, I, I would agree that it's not until the client is told by the court that the prenup that they relied upon is not enforceable that they would first learn that they might have a potential claim or claim against their attorney. Obviously, all those years that they had the agreement in their file, in their possession, and were told it's going to protect you, they didn't know they had a problem on their hands. So there's no doubt in my mind that the statute is extended in that case. With regard to the prenups, continue to see the situation whereby both clients thought they're, I mean, when there's a one lawyer situation, it's not uh, going to be favorable to that lawyer when both clients thought that they were being represented by that lawyer on the prenup because whoever loses has the claim then. You just set yourself up as a lawyer to be in a conflict position. And then the final piece I'll say is that sometimes you can do too good a job for your client. Yeah, we, we whoop the other side. This is totally favorable to you. You got everything. <laughs> that may not work in the end. I mean, and, and make sure the client's advised of that. This is very one-sided. There's a concern I have that this may actually work against you in the end because it's so one-sided that you're it does very much appear that you've taken advantage of your spouse. 
everything is going to you. It's great. You, you did a great job of kicking the other side's tail. That may actually backfire in the end. And as long as the client's aware of that, because you've advised them of that, that sometimes you can do too, too good of a job in, in that, that it probably won't be enforced in the end because you've taken such advantage of the other side, especially if they're not represented. That's a caution that then the client will look to you years down the road and say, you told me I, I got everything and you did such a great job for me and this was thrown out. It's just one of those weird areas of the law where unlike uh, normal litigation where you can have a great day in court and whip someone's tail and prevail, by doing that at the outset, as Greg pointed out, things may change. Uh, they may be so unfavorable or so one-sided that it actually works against your client. And um, uh, that's just a cautionary note in that in that uh, field of practice. And we are seeing it. In yeah. fact, Greg's familiar with the case we're working on right now where that's kind of the situation. Uh, we have a question uh, from a viewer. Uh, she asks, uh, Greg, have you seen the courts throwing out these prenups or are you anticipating uh, that it could happen? Or are you just suggesting that lawyers should be aware of the possibility? I, I guess this, this viewer would like to know if, if you've actually seen prenups thrown out. And the answer is yes. This is not a uh, potential yeah. thing. I know of at least two malpractice cases currently pending uh, where prenups were thrown out and both the prenups were designed to protect the husband. And um, in both cases of uh, the court threw them out based upon um, what the court viewed as circumstances changing substantially. And that was both times it's before COVID. So I'm suggesting COVID would actually exacerbate the issue. In both cases, the two that I know for, uh, for sure, the uh, uh, trial court said this agreement may have been fair then, I don't know, it's not, fair today um, through that actually, as um, um, uh, Brian was saying, um, uh, uh, you know, these, um, uh, they didn't have full awareness at the time of, of the law in terms of circumstancing and what that would mean. And I'm not going to enforce it because it went too far. They did too good a job, uh, as Brian said. Uh, in terms of that, and now with these circumstances, even uh, it was too good a job then, and it's way too good a job now. In addition to the two cases that I know of cases, uh, the husband uh, hired an attorney um, uh, uh, and has sued the lawyer drafted the prenup for, mal, uh, for malpractice. Um, I know of at least two appellate cases within the last two years, I want to say, where the trial court has thrown out agreements on the same basis. So this is a real live issue. Um, it's something that absolutely happens. And part of the problem in this too is prenups are different um, in terms of signing it because um, in a divorce, okay, yesterday um, I did this uh, mediation to give an example, we reached an agreement and I had the uh, one of the lawyers redraft the agreement I had it signed before we finished the mission, and they're going to get a court date hopefully within the next week or two. So they're signing a document to be immediately applicable when they're going to be in court. You sign a prenup, you're not thinking, the parties are not thinking of what's going to happen when I get divorced because they're not thinking of getting divorced, they're thinking. Of so basically, they're going to sign things without considering whatever the lawyer may explain to them. Uh, these are really, really good um, opportunities for lawyers to videotape the signing ceremony if you uh, and have a signing ceremony, have the parties present with the attorneys and sit down and then do a video presentation um, of this is exactly what Brian and Matt were explaining. These, these are the options. Here's what we're recommending. This is how this plays plays out, have them acknowledge it. You can't later say, hey, this was never explained to me. And, oh, I never got that email. Oh, I never got that letter. My lawyer never told me this. So yeah. uh, those, I think, are, are terrific um, uh, uh, helps for the attorneys if 10, 15 years down the line, the discovery rule applies, and they find out that the difference between what the prenup said and now is something they want the uh, other party, their client wants paid from the attorney's malpractice coverage. Greg, are you using or seeing more video signings and more use of video generally uh, than, than ever no. before? 
No, because the ones with the video don't end up in um, malpractice cases. Okay, so <laughs> so. Gotcha. I only see you know I'm, uh, I'm the doctor that that only sees people when they're sick. Okay, they're healthy. Okay, so I only see people who have they're disagreeing in terms of what I, I suspect that the reason for that is that when they do these signing ceremony, get the form together, do the video, everybody explains that, that it creates quite a good chilling effect from test it later, because there's going to be this video of them hearing what the lawyer said, acknowledging it and agreeing to it. I wouldn't see those cases. Cases that I see, the cases that I know of, the cases that have been appealed are the cases where those are not done. And then he could say, I never saw this. I never heard it. I knew nothing about this. This is a complete surprise to me. Question from a, a viewer, Greg. Uh, he writes, thrown out or no longer equitable to enforce. And, and I guess my question would be, is, is there a difference there? Tommy, I'm, I'm sorry, you cut out. Can you say it again? Uh, the comment or question from a viewer, you were talking about the courts throwing out these prenups. Uh, the, the viewer wrote, thrown out or no longer equitable to enforce. Again, I, you cut out a little bit there. I'm sorry. The question is the prenup. The, the uh, question. The, 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 yeah, the, the, the viewer is asking for clarification. You said that these, the courts were throwing out these prenups and the, the viewer wrote, are they, throwing them out, are they throwing them out or are they just ruling that they're no longer equitable to enforce? Same, di same difference. Yeah, I was going to say, is there a difference? I, I guess yeah. I don't. I don't distinguish necessarily, but okay. If they're no longer equitable in force, they're effectively thrown out. Yeah. Um, and then another viewer wrote, I take it that the future circumstances or scenarios that might change could perhaps be contemplated and discussed in, in the present. How might that be accomplished uh, through scenario planning? Uh, do, you do, do you do things like that? Hard to predict the future, as you suggested, yeah, you Yogi Berra. Um, it's, it's some lawyers have attempted doing it, and the way they do it is through percentages rather than dollar amounts. So rather than saying married um, uh, X years, um, dollars paid Y years, so many dollars paid, to do it as a percentage of something. Um, that might be better. Uh, um, because if you say that um, you take the estate and um, uh, right now it's a million dollars and uh, in the event of a divorce in five years, it'll be 10% of any increase and 10 years, it'll be 20%, something like that. That does make sense in that if the estate goes down, whatever percent of zero is zero. Um, the problem is defining the terms then of what you're going to use in terms of valuing the estate. Um, and those definitions can be difficult, and sometimes uh, people are going to disagree as to what would be included in it. So um, uh, percentage is one way of maybe getting around that problem. Uh, I'm not sure it solves, um, uh, it solves every issue. Um, you know, quite honestly, if somebody's going to find a way to fight or argue or dispute something, they're going to find some methodology of doing it and some reason to do it if they want to at the time. And the the other uh, common time, as I made before, COVID has changed this, is um, this situation that nobody predicted. And we're not sure where, uh, where we're headed on this. Uh, hopefully, um, you know, the, uh, we've peaked in terms of on the way down, it'll be back to normality soon. And like the Spanish flu, it'll be another 100 years before we ever see this again. I sure hope that's the case. But if you're um, expecting me to predict that, not going to happen. Yeah, gotcha. Um, Brian, you mentioned family law is now uh, up, up in the top two um, in, in 2021 in terms of frequency of claims. What other, what other issues are, are so problematic in this area? Well, the one I want, and I'm curious to see what Greg thinks, and that, not to throw him under the bus because we're not talking about him specifically, but... Family law tends to see more 
fee related issues than any other area of law that uh, that we track and and I don't know that that's fair to the family law practitioner, but I think it's fair and something that we need to address in a program like this, because even this year, uh, and I'm looking at the actual data, we've had two lawsuit counterclaims whereby the firm is suing to collect fees and they're, then they get a counterclaim. Uh, and just a general, you know, general response being that I didn't get the outcome I was looking for, you didn't, you weren't responsive to me during the handling of the divorce. I'm not necessarily happy with the with the end result, and as such, I don't. I'm not going to pay you for your fee. Uh, or and the common theme is that there's a fairly significant outstanding balance at the end of the representation. And I have to say, just anecdotally from the ones that we track. It doesn't work out great for the attorney uh, on the counterclaim. They end up compromising significantly on the bill after the lawsuit's filed and or waiving the entire amount so as to get out of a lawsuit wherein they're exposing, uh, they have to defend the case, they have to defend their work. There's a deductible involved if they're insured in general. And um, it just is a, it's a problematic issue. And I don't know, and I'm not talking about Greg specifically, but because he practices in this area, I'd really be curious if he had any thoughts or ideas as to how one might avoid uh, a large outstanding balance at the conclusion of a divorce and thoughts on filing a suit against a client to collect. And from, I'll just say, I have no problem that lawyers should be paid for their work, but they do. I don't like it when clients don't pay and then file a counterclaim. There's no merit. But I do think it's uh, notable at this type of program to bring this up, and um, and I'll throw it to Greg. I know the state bar, bar has a fee arbitration program that um, I'm not sure how successful that is. But Greg, any thoughts about the the fee issue in family law and why it tends to create claim issues? Yeah, um, I, I should mention. Um... Brian, first that of the, I probably served as an expert witness in um, uh, malpractice cases in this area, I would guess uh, 40 or 50 times over the years. It seemed to always have one or two cases pending at any one time. I would estimate that at least half and probably thirds of the malpractice claims are claims on a few lawsuit. Um, if not a direct counterclaim, the lawyer at least threatened to sue for fees. And in most of the cases, uh, it was involved one about a year and a half ago, um, a phenomenal result. Uh, uh, the wife, we pay her lawyer, the lawyer sued uh, for malpractice, uh, for fees rather, and there was a countersuit for malpractice. And I would guess that's in at least half the cases I've been involved in, and probably two thirds of them. Um, the answer that my firm reached in this many, many years is probably not one most lawyers are going to like because we actually had that happen to us. We had a case where we reach, really achieved an excellent result. Um, the client um, didn't pay. Uh, we filed a lawsuit. He filed a counterclaim for malpractice. Um, he could not find an expert uh, because the um, he really got an excellent result. Um, he ended up uh, having a fight with his own attorney. The long story, eventually the court granted some motion uh, against him, uh, both on the uh, malpractice and on our fees. And we uh, ended up collecting 100% of our fees. The malpractice case was just with prejudice. And we made the decision. My, uh, uh, I think Leonard was my partner at the time. He may have been my boss. I don't remember. It was so many years ago. But we made the decision that our answer was that we will never, ever, ever again sue a client for fees. Because if we sue a client for fees and we collect, but the result is we have to pay the deductible in the malpractice. It is some, you don't want to go to court to defend yourself. It takes up time you'd rather use for something else. It's embarrassing. We're in front of a judge we know. And even though we were right and we won and everything, it's not the way we want to spend our time. And we made the decision, this is probably 25 years ago, that it'll be the last time we ever sue client for fees. We're just not going to do it. And I know that solution doesn't work for everyone, but it works for us because what I tell clients is at the beginning of an action, as I say, I'm going to be billing you. Um, here's how we're going to work out fees in the case. And then I always say the fees 
that you're going to actually pay me. You're going to have to agree to be worth it and reasonable and earned. Because if you don't, I'm not going to see you. You're just not going to pay it. I have never had a client refuse to pay fees. They have sometimes said, well, that seems to be a lot at the end and I've adjusted the amount. I've never had a client refuse to pay, but part of it is, is I try to be very careful. And this is hint, uh, tip number one, the most important, which it falls in the category of easier said than done, which is choose your client very, very carefully. If you have someone who has a history of non-paying lawyers, you have somebody who's looking for their third or fourth lawyer, the previous three, two or three lawyers have not been paid. Okay, there's a message. Look up every client that calls on CCAP. I don't care. It's a rule. I don't talk to somebody unless somebody from my office has reviewed that CCAP. And if there are three um, credit card companies that have pending lawsuits, two lawyers have pending lawsuits, a lot of times we see health companies, hospitals that are sued, they don't pay their bills. I don't want that person as a client. And the concept of being that client, because uh, you'll collect the retainer, but never see anything like later, I don't think it's a particularly good idea. So that, again, may not work for everybody, but um, a client selection is critical. Court. The evergreen clause is the typical answer most give in terms of the issue that you're bringing up. The evergreen clause meaning, okay, you're gonna put money in my trust account. When it begins to be depleted, you're gonna replenish it. And therefore, I'll always stay ahead of the game in terms of what's owed. The problem is, is the gap period of time between the trust account being depleted, the amount of time the client would have to beat that to make to refresh it, and the time it would take to get into court to withdraw as counsel. And you may be talking at best several months if you're in Milwaukee County, it, no problem. A court date can be three, four months down the line, even for just to withdraw as counsel. And, the amount, and you're still the lawyer during that period of time and you still have responsibility. So even though the quote standard answer end quote was in there, that doesn't work uh, for me. And I don't think that that um, is a, a good, uh, certainly not a perfect way, and a lot of times not a good way of protecting the attorney. Um, so, you know, the um, uh, concept is, is be careful of the, of the client, uh, develop a relationship with the client, uh, be honest with the client. Um, I spoke, Tom asked me to speak at uh, this seminar about three, four years ago on the issue of uh, what happens if you make a mistake. And I uh, accused Tom of asking me to speak because I make more mistakes than anybody else out there. I got more experience. That may be the fact, but it's being honest and direct with clients. And one of two things, you know, these cases never go well. You know, there's always a glitch, always a problem, something the client doesn't want. And there's no substitute for being direct with the client and say, oh. here are the issues, here's the problems, here what we're going to do to correct it. And if you have a client that's expecting perfection, that's a client you don't want to represent. I, I don't care if you have an evergreen clause in there or not. Yeah. <clears throat> Good advice, Greg. And I think you, you hit it just on the head is that do the underwriting at the outset and choose your clients carefully. And then uh, Sally Anderson used to always say, you want to choose what clients you do pro bono work for, and probably not the divorce that's uh, a difficult divorce. It is not the one you want to do pro bono. Yeah, the um, there are a series of rules of of uh, uh, um, uh, choosing when you should choose or should not choose clients. And my rent being due next month is not a really good reason to choose a client. Yeah. Uh, rule number one is when your legal assistant tells you don't take that client because yeah. he's a better judgment than the attorney. And if you violate that rule, you're going to be hearing, I told you so a million times. Well, it, it's so true, Greg. And, and we've talked, you know, we've, we've talked many times at, at seminars about the very things you, you've discussed, you know, the, the proactive red flags that you can, that you can identify. And, and another one is just what you just said, which is, um, you know, how a potential client treats your uh, staff 
can can uh, certainly uh, uh, be revealing um, because you, as the attorney, they might they might address you or treat you a little differently than than somebody else uh, in the office, and uh, that that's a telltale sign. And and you're right, uh, staff can also be very perceptive and uh, and can help you determine when a client is probably not the right client. But uh, uh, those are all really important things. Client selection can be huge. Um, and the other thing too is. Uh, I wanted to mention, you know, you you have a policy that you won't sue, and I we've talked about fees for many, many, many years, and and we've run across at presentations. I, I've run across lawyers who say to me exactly what you did, which is, um, uh, you know, uh, I won't sue. And then I have other lawyers who say, you bet I'm going to sue for fees because that um, that money is owed to me. And so I've seen completely diametrically opposed viewpoints on this, and. Uh, I guess it's a it's a personal question uh, that that every lawyer has to answer, but um, uh, it, it's interesting out there. And and I know Brian and Matt, you guys you guys see this all the time uh, in claims the the fee issues and really communication too is another big one. Greg, you you hit on it too the the idea of being really upfront with clients about how the fee structure is going to work and what they can anticipate and that sort of thing because often. Uh, the clients get they get surprised right uh, all of a sudden they see this bill and they they weren't expecting it and surprises can can lead to trouble too a couple of follow-up points and greg did a, a great job of basically covering a lot of the material in our outline um but uh, a couple of things one with, with respect to billing um I, I think greg has a very good handle on what you know his firm's billing practices are, and they they stick to it. Um, you know, so if bills are going to be or are, are explained to the client uh, to be sent monthly, do it. Yeah, make sure that they are sent monthly and that and regularly, so that they see that there's you know ongoing work and they see what they're paying for. Uh, one of my early mentors um, said, you know, the best way for a lawyer to communicate with his client. Is, is through a bill because you know they're actually going to read it. Um, so, so be, uh, you know, conversation with you uh, probably doesn't say enough. Uh, conversation with you regarding prenuptial agreement and a thorough explanation of all options available before you decide it is something that is a little more descriptive. Um, and that is sort of beginning with the end in mind with your billing practices. Um, and and you know, not that you want uh, to end up in a fee dispute with your client, but if you do, you know, have you adequately described what you did uh, so that, you know, the issue of collecting that fee isn't, isn't one. Um, and you've, you've done a good job of communicating with your client, uh, billing regularly, uh, and then, uh, you know, collection of it, uh, you know, don't let the client get behind. Um, Greg mentioned a couple of options, including the evergreen option. Um, but uh, once the client gets behind, I think then is, is, is when you need to start asking real critical questions about whether or not you want to continue representation. Um, and then before you actually do make the ultimate decision to sue for fees, you know, we've got a, a list of considerations on page 11 of your Wilmick outline. Um, you know, was the client pleased or should they have been? You know, Greg mentioned the one case on which he sued. You know, he got a fantastic result uh, for the client. Um, are you critical of your own performance? Um, have you had a, a, a third or a second or a third set of eyes take a look uh, at the file? You know, is that feasible? Um, is there somebody that you, you've networked with that you trust that would be able to tell you, you know, you should have done this, you should have done that. You're kind of vulnerable here, you know, so that if you do sue for fees, you might, you know, be facing that malpractice claim. Um, and then, you know, even if you obtain a judgment, What's the outcome of that? You know, is it something that's collectible, or is it just a piece of paper you can frame and put on your wall? Um, you know, and and you know, what harm is it going to do to your reputation? All of those things, you know, give it give it some thought. Um, the reflex, I don't think, should be, uh, I haven't been paid. I'm going to sue. Um, the reflex should be, I'm not paid. Why? What's going on? And maybe even ask the client that question. You know, why are you not pleased? Why are you not paying the bill? Have I not done what you asked? You know, those those. That feedback uh, may one help you, um, may explain what's going on, and may present alternatives. You know, maybe there's a payment agreement you can enter into with the client uh, to pay some of it over time. You know, whatever it is, I think it's uh, it's reasonable 
um, to explore different solutions before immediately going, you know, to the, the route of suing your client. Um, our job at Wilmick, I think, is to point out the risks of facing a malpractice claim. Um, but uh, unlike uh, maybe some other carriers, you know, we want you to get paid. Um, as, as our policyholders, you're a, a better, healthier lawyer if you're getting paid for the work, the hard work that you do. Uh, and that's, that's at least how I approach it. Um, and, I, you know, I think that's, that's generally Wilmick's approach. Yeah, one, one final piece on that, which is related to the fee, but more in terms of protecting yourself on a legal malpractice. And I'll, I'll talk to Bill second half. We were at a deposition yesterday. The, the, the billing statement is a very important document in terms of, at least in the mind of a legal malpractice attorney. In other words, when you say, well, I met with the client and we talked on this date, they will scrutinize the, the bill and say, well, why isn't that on there? And one of the answers is, well, I, I, wasn't go I didn't charge my client. I, we talked that day and they make that look like that's not true. So I, I only say one thing that be very cognizant of the fact that you're, if there's ever a mistake, your file will be scrutinized and they'll, one of the big big documents, of course, of course in a fee dispute case, but even in a legal malpractice case, they're gonna look at every line item on, the, on your billing statement. And, uh, and I know I'm a fan of the no charge. Um, when I practice, sometimes you meet with a client or talk with a client and you don't charge them. I would just recommend only from the, with full benefit of hindsight and sitting where I do now, Make that note, August 20th, met with client, no charge. What, uh, just have that as a document because five years from now or whenever that three months from now, I won't remember the date and time, but it's very important that it's true. You talk to that person, whether you charge them or not, it's a great record of the communication that you may have had with the client. And it's definitely going to benefit you in terms of defending the idea that, well, you never talked to me. You never met with me. Well, that's not true. I know I did, but that and the, my documents support that. Whether or not the charge is actually made to the client is irrelevant. It's the it's a record of the communication and the date and time in which it took place. A comment and a question uh, from the viewers. Uh, one viewer wrote, "When I was a legal assistant, I had told my boss if he took a certain client, I was going to quit. He did <laughs> not. He did not take that client." Uh, and the other one is. Uh, a uh, question from a viewer, do we always need court approval to stop representing a client? I understand that we can't leave them in the lurch prior to a hearing or trial. How can we be forced to represent someone who isn't paying during the discovery process, for example? Greg? Well, it, for, it, in terms of the first my, a, a tip in terms of this, but this is, I like simple tips, things that are easy. Um, and the staff was, uh, I, I have a very simple, easy tip on that. Uh, I like being on time with my clients. Client shows up for a meeting. I like being there. I hate when I go see a, a, a doctor and have to wait a half hour, hour, whatever sitting. So I'm, uh, I really try to be on time with one exception. If it's a potential new client on a consultation, I, I make them wait five minutes, 10 minutes, not more than that. And the reason is, is I have my staff members talk to them while they're waiting, and then I get a report back later about uh, how they reacted. So it's just a simple thing, and it's just, <laughs> they don't know, of course, that they're being uh, uh, talked to. They think my staff's just being friendly. And most of the time, the report back is, uh, oh, I hope you represent that person. He or she was really nice. But every once in a while, a staff member says, to that person for three minutes and like the viewer said if i uh, you take that person i'm out of here um uh and the question tom again was uh uh grab it real quick here do we always need court approval to stop representing a client um how can we be forced to represent someone oh, who, yeah, isn't, th who isn't paying this is this a huge risk here in terms of lawyers because you know we are not um in a family law action, uh, we file a either a petition or notice of retainer, we are that lawyer until the court releases us. So if we have to apply and there's this gap period and it's a really scary thing um, between you've had a falling out with your client and the court formally leaves you. 
If the person has a new attorney, then it's not difficult. Yes, I have a new attorney relying on that attorney's advice. It's that interim where if you don't answer the client's question, um, they could claim that you're not performing your duty. You're still the attorney of record, but you don't want to be giving that person advice. You don't want to be the attorney anymore. Um, I once heard of a, a hearing where the court refused to release an attorney. It's rare, but I know it happens because I remember the uh, attorney saying, Your Honor, excuse me, but but I believe it's the 13th Amendment that made very unconstitutional. I don't think the judge was an argument, but I, I thought it was a pretty interesting argument. Um, the solution uh, is that you don't wait to be released until you have a trial date uh, panting, uh, you know, you're, you're breathing down your neck. Uh, because th that's the cases. And the one I just mentioned when the judge refused to release someone is it it was a trial date coming up. The court didn't want to deal with say client. So this decision has to be made earlier. If there is no trial date, trial date sufficiently down the road, you're not going to have a problem with the judge. Judge could care less if you're that lawyer, somebody else, or if the person um, is going to be pro se. But you don't bring that motion to withdraw if you have a trial date coming up uh, within soon proximity, and it's a case where that person really should have an attorney, then you're going to have a problem. So you've got to make that decision early. Yeah, I think there's kind of a point of no return, isn't there, Greg? Once you're, you know, yeah. you get, yeah, yeah. It's a good point. Um, yeah. Um, comment from a view back to uh, Brian, your your comment about, uh, you know, letters detailing when you've met with clients and so forth. The uh, viewer writes, send the client a no charge letter detailing the conversation. Um, so that that's just another uh, a way that someone does that. Um, we've got about four minutes left. I, I want to uh, get takes from all of you uh greg matt and brian on uh things that that might be down the road things lurking that lawyers need to be aware of um not only that that covid may present but 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 anything else uh, and i know greg um i i talked to you about um and you mentioned it earlier you know the, the question about it whether a, a, a young child should get a vaccine when they become available or whether they should go to in-person school or stay home remotely parents can disagree about those things and they will and we've seen how those issues have become so divisive in our society. Um, I assume those are issues that family law attorneys will have to continue to, to deal with, uh, and, and maybe others as well. Am I correct? Yeah, and I'm just going to touch on a couple that are um, that have come up that um, did occur before. They're not so much malpractice related, but we're, we're all notwithstanding my comments about not suing for fees, uh, fees are awfully nice and we're trying to stay in business. And what COVID did, again, the unpredictability of it. So I'm recently faced with the issue is um, um, my building wanted me to sign a long, uh, longer term lease. And I'm thinking, I wonder what's gonna happen with commercial real estate. Because from what I see walking, around downtown and even though it's improved a little bit not much and does that make me rates are coming down and does that mean i want to sign a, a shorter term lease than i otherwise I may want to the other one is the question I, and i mentioned this in the outline is in terms of business interruption insurance um, most business interruption insurance including mine does not include anything about a pandemic fighter. I know my business suffered as a result of COVID. Uh, we did get a, a PPP loan, which really helped us, uh, that was eventually forgiven. And it was a major help, but I don't know if that's going to happen in the future and what it is. And I think it's lawyers should consider. And then I finally put in the final one about whether lawyers should decide if this is a good time to retire. I know a few lawyers that didn't. Um, and I'm a uh, 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 Sorry, Tom, but uh, I'll be available for your seminar next year, the year after, because uh, uh, I, I I don't have a life, so I have no intention of retiring at the moment. <laughs> you're, you're, not, you're not going anywhere. You're, you're going to be around. Okay. Well, if well I, that... I didn't retire my middle. All right. Good to know. Uh, Matt. <clears throat> Yeah, real quickly, uh, Greg has some materials in, in his uh, handouts uh, discussing the possibility of a, a flood of, of uh, family law and, and specifically divorce work. 
Uh, we don't know if that's going to happen. I think it's a, it's, there are mixed uh, results from surveys that have been taken about the health of, of uh, marriages out there as a result of the pandemic. Uh, in, in the event that you do want to uh, dabble, uh, we, we often talk about this topic, uh, just be sure to make yourself competent. Uh, study family law, uh, associate with those who've been there before, um, and, and do what you need to do to make sure uh, that you not only meet your, your ethical responsibilities, but uh, also do a good job for your clients. And I'll, I'll leave it at that to give Brian, you know, the last 10 seconds. <laughs> Thank you, Matt. <clears throat> well, the only other takeaway is we are seeing claims that at, we're having to back to the beginning. Family law is the number two area for 2021. And I think, uh, just to be a, on the legal malpractice side of things, and Greg mentioned retirement, I, I would recommend that if you are in getting close to retirement and have practice in the area of family law, consult with your carrier. Obviously, if, if you're with Wilmick, talk to our underwriter about coverage that would maybe protect you or would will protect you in the event that you retire and you get a claim down the road. There is a There are policy provisions, extended uh, reporting endorsements, things that would cover you in the in the future so that you, when you're on the beach, retired, if a claim comes in that you never anticipated years down the road, which we see, you have coverage and can continue to have coverage and enjoy your retirement. Yeah, good point. All right, uh, 1016, uh, Greg, Matt, Brian, thank you so much. Uh, really good topics today, good conversation. Uh, Viewers, I hope, uh, hope you have some takeaways and learn something. Um, we'll take a 15-minute break. We will be back at 1030 uh, with Bill Williams and Matt and Brian. We'll talk uh, estate planning. Uh, Greg, thank you so much. Thank much you, appreciate Tim. It. Thank you, Brian, Matt. All yeah. right. We'll be back in 15.
All right, welcome back everyone. It is 1031. We are on to session number two. Uh, hopefully you learned something uh, about the family law issues that are out there in the first session. Uh, our apologies once again for the uh, audio uh, problems that we were experiencing. Uh, I don't think we have any of that uh, for this session and, and hopefully that'll stay that way. I wanna welcome into the conversation, uh, Bill Williams. Uh, he's an attorney in Madison. Uh, focusing on estate planning issues. And we've had Bill uh, before uh, for a very good reason. Um, we always learn something from him and, uh, and he's got a lot of great wisdom uh, for us. So Bill, welcome to the panel. Um, we, uh, we're talking about um, you know, issues that have come up during the pandemic and, uh, and issues generally uh, that, that have caused some issues in, uh, caused problems in the estate planning world. And um, maybe what's lurking in the future, and I know you're you're prepared to talk about all that. And I, I'll throw it to you. And and I know you wanted to comment on on a couple of the things we finished the last session with, and then uh, and then also enlighten us on some of the other things that you've been seeing out there in your practice. Thanks, Tom, and I, I appreciate being asked back, and I appreciate people coming back for this second session. I would like to just segue by talking about a couple of the issues that uh, were discussed at the end of the last session uh, because my other I, I am an active state planner, meaning I have an active state planning practice, but I also uh, do legal malpractice defense in this area. And uh, having yesterday I was I was in a, a deposition and Nobody likes to be deposed. It's it's a miserable experience, but it's even worse if you're the defendant. But I can't emphasize strongly enough how big a role the your your file has, and particularly your bills have in a malpractice case. The plaintiffs in legal malpractice cases pour over every entry. And we'll go through every entry where they think there's anything useful, um, both for what's in there and what's not. So uh, just, just two examples. You'll dash off a, you know, a quick entry in your timesheet that says uh, prepared memo to client on, on this date. Well, the, it'll go like this. What was the memo about? Where is the memo? And when did the client actually get it? So when you write that down in your timesheet, realize that years, maybe 10 years later, you could end up being asked to uh, prove that the memo existed because as, as Brian put it, some of this is trying to make you look bad, um, either disorganized or outright billing for things you didn't do. Um, it, the negative side of that is you never know what you say to a client that's going to end up being important in your defense years later. And that'll go like this. Well, did you ever mention to my client this legal consideration? Sure, we talked about it. Okay, and then this is, this is what happens. When did you talk about it? You say, well, it was, you know, I, I think it was sometime in March after our first meeting or something like that. I don't see that on your timesheet. So, and, and that'll be the end of that discussion, but you can bet that is going to come back again and it's going to insinuate that either you didn't have that conversation or you can't prove what was talked about because it's too long ago. So the unfortunate truth is that the best thing you can do for yourself is document almost everything you say to your client. It doesn't have to be exhaustive, but you know, the, one of the uh, participants said that sending a letter memorializing a no charge conference is a good idea. That's a great idea. Uh, it can be even easier. You can send an email that says, you know, it's good to talk to you today. And I enjoyed our discussion about, if you have any questions about what we talked about, please contact me. And as long as you save your emails, which is another issue, um, it will be a great day when, you know, the plaintiff's attorney says, well, did you really say that? And you say, yeah. And in fact, here's the email that I sent the client memorializing our conversation. That's, that's a happy day for us sitting on the defense side of the table. 
Yeah, Matt and Brian like to see those too. Yeah. Uh, well, and so do I when I'm looking through the file, particularly when they can be produced years and years later. Right. Um, just quickly on a couple of other things, I'm going to use up all my time talking about this, but uh, documentation is critical at the outset. Another thing that you will be talking about in detail if you are deposed in a case where you're a practice defendant is your engagement letter. Uh, we don't like spending time on our engagement letters because it's, you know, you can't really bill for it. And it's, we want to get going on the case. We don't want to mess with this. But if you word your engagement letter, you know, I've agreed to represent you and here's my rate. Plaintiff's lawyer and the courts will read that as you've pretty much opened the door for complete responsibility for whatever this person walked into the door to talk to you about. So if you have in mind that, no, I'm not doing your whole estate plan over, all I'm doing is preparing a codicil for you, it better say that in the engagement letter. We'll talk later about limiting the scope of your engagement, but if you don't do that in writing and preferably with the client signing on that they've agreed to it, uh, you can expect a plaintiff's lawyer to say, you were responsible for this collateral aspect of the estate plan that didn't go so well. Um, last thing I'll touch on is there was a lot of talk about client selection. Um, I have spoken for Wilmick before and people are probably sick of hearing it, but another very important part of this process is identifying who your client is. And that of course takes place at the outset. Uh, just this week, I was contacted about a situation where someone said, We'd like you to represent the trustees of this family trust in a dispute with some disappointed beneficiaries. Anytime someone asks you to represent someone in the plural, that's a red flag. Uh, you have to, on the front end, sort out which of those trustees you're, you're going to represent. Do they have conflicts between them and then? If you decide, I mean, the optimal thing is to say, sorry, I'll represent one of them and the other better get their own lawyer. Sometimes that's not realistic or people just won't do it. But if you represent multiple clients, you need their informed consent after you disclose the pros and cons, including the potential that something you didn't foresee after you've already vetted this uh, will result in a conflict that makes it inappropriate for you to represent both of them. And in that scenario, usually the outcome is you can't represent either of them and they have to start all over again with new lawyers. It's really important that if you decide to represent multiple clients, that you disclose on the front end that that is a possibility, even though you have reviewed the situation and you don't believe it exists now. So end of sermon on that. Uh, I'm going to now talk real quickly through some of the points in my outline and then we'll, we'll throw this open to discussion. The, it, we've all had our own experience during the pandemic. I've talked to some lawyers that were barely affected in their practice, others who you know haven't met with a client face to face for, for a year. Um, that limited ability to meet people and meet with them face to face has forced us to use these video techniques or just phone calls. I think we all probably feel that second best because it's hard to take someone's temperature uh, kind of in a two dimensional format like this. But I think the bar has been very innovative on handling these things. Another thing that we've seen is I think some people were panicked into rushing into estate plans which has consequences for them and for us. Uh, and then there's the whole document execution thing. And this is another opportunity for me to mention my favorite term, the drive-by execution. I don't know who coined this, but it's referring to having clients drive into a driveway or parking lot, handing documents through a window with witnesses looking through the windshield uh, to try to minimize exposure to you know, what at the beginning was unvaccinated and potentially infected people. That's a very creative solution, but certainly not, not an ideal. Uh, 
some of us have tried to coach document signings remotely. Uh, my experience with trying to tell people how to execute valid will or something you want executed with the dignities of a will is fraught. I've had documents come back witnessed by you know, the signer, <laughs> witnessed by interested persons, uh, notarized but not witnessed, all sorts of kind of disastrous outcomes that put the validity of the document in question. Um, some people have resorted to using electronic authentication, which doesn't work for estate planning documents. We'll talk about that. Um, I've also personally considered the prospect of having, when all else fails, a document witnessed by an interested person realizing that that does not invalidate the document, but it affects the distribution to that person. So, you know, these are absolute last resort things. And even uh, considering executions out of state where the laws are, are different. So people have been very creative, but now that hopefully we're getting on the back end of this, we've got some risks. And some of these are just kind of the routine things that happen when people do estate planning. Some are more pandemic specific, but you've got what I call testator's remorse. People made a will when pandemic was looming, and now they look at it and go, that's not what I want, or I want something more. That, that's not your fault, but it, it's maybe a situation that creates some potential risk for you. I, I've got a lot of estate plans that are still not done because people said, well, okay, let's do the powers of attorney now and we'll do a will or trust later. Well, it's later now. So you need to think about those. Uh, I think we also have to go back and review those situations where the execution was maybe okay, maybe not. Um, these are, you know, this is all time out of your day, but certainly Will McFeels, and as someone who has some experience with legal malpractice, time you spend now trying to clean these things up or make them better is time well spent. Um, We can go back over these if, if there's more time, but I don't think the appropriate response is, well, that was done. Those aren't my clients anymore. You know, they've got to do the best they can. In estate planning, unless your correspondence with the client is very clear, there is a live question whether these people are still current clients. Um, it, some estate planners will completely disengage, but I, I think that's the minority. And Given that the attorney-client relationship is evaluated subjectively from the position of the client, uh, I think you need to assume in a lot of instances that these are still ongoing client relationships, particularly if you said, you know, I'll keep you apprised of estate planning developments. That kind of thing can be used to show that you may have owed a duty to help update. So what are your obligations? The Supreme Court rules require competence, diligence, and candor. Don't forget that the attorney-client relationship is a fiduciary relationship. Uh, you have to act solely in the best interest of your client. Of course, you can bill for them, but where the rubber hits the road on this is if you have prepared something for someone and it's less than perfect, you have a threshold question of whether you should even be talking to them. I've been to seminars where legal malpractice defense lawyers say, if you uncover a problem, you should limit your contact to, there's a potential problem with this, you should seek legal counsel. That may be appropriate in some extreme situations, but one nice thing about estate planning is that as long as your clients are alive and competent, it's a fluid situation and it can be remedied. You have to be careful how you approach that. You can't be anything short of completely candid about your responsibility for any problems and how they need to be fixed. That may lead to some tough discussions about who's going to pay for this or not, but don't turn your arguably imperfect performance of your legal services into a breach of fiduciary duty case. It's a much worse place to be. I'll reiterate again, it's redundant, that you're looking at this 
may depend in part whether you've got a current versus a former client situation. And I'm not always sure that someone's as former a client as attorneys sometimes assume. Uh, I've got a suggestion in the outline about which clients you contact. The more I read that section, the more I realize that that is unrealistic. And what you really ought to be doing is triage and helping those who you can help. Um, another COVID related, but not really aspect of this is we routinely will get asked to review the estate plan of another attorney or review more dangerously a particular aspect of an attorney's estate plan. There needs to be absolute clarity between you and the client as to what that engagement is about for a couple of reasons. One, the client's expectation, reasonable expectation controls. And if you're not clear that, you know, I'm only looking at this life insurance trust and not your whole estate plan, you run the risk that if there's a problem with some of those other documents that you will be called, you will be criticized for not having detected it. If you, on the other hand, can show that was not my engagement, this is all I agreed to do and the client agreed to that, you're in a much better place. Uh, we do have a doctrine under Wisconsin law that is developing toward the concept that if you agree to look at someone's estate plan that was prepared by someone else, you own the whole plan. Uh, and that's the Seltrick case. There are some arguments for or against that. I don't want to take a position on that in this venue, but it's something to consider. So don't, it's always great when someone calls and says, hey, I'd like you to look at and fix my estate plan, but be very careful about what you're doing. I've put some text in about limiting the scope of your representation. That's not as easy as it sounds. It must be done very carefully. And you absolutely cannot write anything in that limits your liability perspective. That is verboten. Uh, last thing I'll touch on, having gone way over already, is that a, Tim Pierce put out an interesting piece on whether you can represent a client in the context where client and that client's now former spouse came to you for some joint estate planning. Uh, I think we were all pleased to see that the ethics mavens agree that there are situations where it's completely appropriate to continue to represent your client after they're divorced, even if that means disinheriting the former spouse. I would caution you that that's not always going to be the case. And this is really tough because this could be a client you've had for years and now they're divorced and they're looking to you. You have to be absolutely sure that you don't owe an obligation to that now ex-spouse that would prevent you from changing the estate planning documents that you worked on. The context of Tim's example was a divorce with a complete disinheritance. Divorces don't always work that way. Sometimes there are obligations baked into the divorce agreement to continue to make distributions on death to, a, to somebody, and you've got to review those. So I, would, I included Tim's blog with his consent. I'd review it carefully, but it is not a free pass in all cases. Whenever two of your clients divorce, go ahead and represent one of them and, and not the other. So with that truncated review, I, I think I'll throw it back for, for discussion. Thanks, Bill. Uh, yeah, interesting topics uh, to, to talk about. Um, you mentioned the issue of uh, someone coming and saying, I, I that's not what I want anymore. I want more. Are those changes of heart? Are you seeing that as COVID related or are there other pressures, outside pressures, or maybe a combination? It's not new. I, I don't know if it's more frequent. I don't know if people have even, well, first of all, I'm not sure that people all perceive COVID being over yet. So this may be something that there will be more of as time goes on. 
Uh, but it's uh, there's a certain baseline of that in any anybody's estate planning practice. Uh, a more practical problem is people come to you for their estate planning. You do the work for them. You tell them this is a process, and they go, "Yeah, right, thanks." And then they don't look at the documents again for twenty years. So, uh, but those who are conscientious about it sometimes do come back and say, "Well, that doesn't work for us anymore." The biggest triggers for that, aside from big life events like divorce or someone dying out of order, if you will, are changes with people's kids. Either way, you know, either the delinquent child straightens up or someone goes off the rails, and now that estate plan doesn't work anymore. So it's it's not a COVID unique thing, but I do think that some people, maybe those who really didn't care about their estate plans before, with people dying by the hundreds of thousands, thought maybe this is something I had to take care of and might have rushed it. Yeah. And uh, we don't, the traditional family, the, the definition of a traditional family now is, well, maybe there isn't a traditional family. We, <laughs> we see so many different uh, iterations of, of that. That's true. Uh, Matt and Brian, I'll, I'll let you guys jump in. Uh, Bill has raised a lot of issues and I know you guys from a claims perspective, uh, see a lot of this stuff. Um, what can you tell us? Well, I can certainly, I, you know, echo some of, of Bill's concerns, you know, I, and I guess I'll focus on what I, what I left, uh, the, our, our morning session or our first session with, which was, uh, you know, the concept of, uh, maintaining competence. Um, you know, I think dabbling is a real issue. Um, and I think lawyers are smart. They're business people. Uh, and uh, they go where the work is. And so I, I think uh, what I'm hearing is that rightly or wrongly, um, you know, there may be a bit of a rush um, or at least a, an increase in uh, the amount of estate planning services um, sought by uh, the general public. Uh, and I think that's that is, um, at least in part, uh, in response to uh, the, the pandemic and, and uh, you know, sort of trying to get your things in order, uh, you know, in the event that the worst happens, there's another risk out there, um, you know, to us as humans. And, uh, you know, we, we respond to that way. Um, and, you know, I, I'm always struck by the statistic, um, you know, that we maintain, which is that, you know, 44% of all claims reported involve an area of practice in which lawyers devote less than 10% of their time. Um, so I, I think that uh, certain practice areas, and we've, we've identified those that are, are usually in the top five, um, you know, just have uh, enough work, enough volume, and have enough pitfalls, you know, that uh, they, they will often become the subject of claims. Um, and as Brian pointed out in, in the early session, you know, 26% of our claims in the first six months of 2021 came in the area of estate probate and trust. So something's going on. Um, and, you know, it's, it's probably, you know, sort of a, a cumulative effect of all the things that are happening in society right now. Um, but if you are one of uh, our, our uh, if you are an attorney who is looking to uh, develop an estate planning practice. Um, what are you doing to make yourself competent? Uh, we're all, you know, lawyers are smart people, um, and we're also we also work very hard. Um, and are you doing enough to study, um, you know, the laws that apply to estate planning? And are you doing enough to, uh, you know, make yourself um, competent by by conversing with people like Bill Williams or others? Um, who, you know, have the sort of expertise necessary to navigate some of these difficult situations that, that we're going to talk about here. Um, and, and just understand that, you know, a lawyer can provide adequate representation in a wholly novel field. Uh, this is from uh, page four, uh, comment two, uh, and, and competent representation can also be provided through the association of a lawyer. All those things that I just mentioned. I happen to be on the solo and small firm and, and general practice board, and we continue, we often analyze, uh, you know, how exactly, you know, can we benefit those members uh, of that section? And the very first thing that we talk about is networking. 
Um, so networking with other lawyers who have been in situations that perhaps you, uh, as, as a, an attorney who wants to venture into a, a new practice area, uh, there are attorneys out there who have been there and who are very, very willing to talk to you. And, and many of them are members of that particular section. Um, but however you do it, um, you know, we strongly encourage uh, attorneys to network uh, so that uh, especially those who are uh, solo or small firm uh, who may not have the benefit of going down the hall to talk to, you know, uh, the local expert. Um, uh, but you have at least a network of people that you can reach out to when you do need that kind of help. Um, you know, and it's, it's not just uh, the lawyer who needs to be competent. Uh, it is also the lawyer's staff. Um, and I think what, what we see often uh, arise is uh, when there's a transition in staff, which sometimes there is more so than a transition of attorneys, um, that particular staff person uh, may be relied upon to take care of some of the, um, uh, the, the smaller pieces of a file or the smaller, the, the, the work that requires, you know, sort of less critical lawyer thinking. Um, I, I think it's very important, one, that lawyers are sure to train their staff in how they would like to see any particular matter or any particular issue or any particular file handled. Uh, but then, especially when it's, it's early on in the employer-employee relationship, uh, make sure that that work is reviewed. Um, you know, even, you know, simple clerical errors like, like mailing can create a, a particular, a, a, a terrific problem uh, to try and, and sort of undo and, and put back together the right way. Um, so keep all of those ideas of competence in mind. Um, you know, Bill, do you have anything to add that might, uh, you know, be particularly useful to our audience uh, about ways to maintain or, or establish competence in the first place in the realm of estate planning? This is an excellent point, and this is something I've been thinking about quite a bit lately. And with estate planning, you you can end up going down some pretty esoteric paths uh, without realizing that you know you may be in over your head to mix the metaphors because it, it's not a new practice area. But you know, if your client needs something that's pretty sophisticated. You have to decide on the fly, you know, whether, boy, that's something I'd really like to do. You know, I haven't done an irrevocable life insurance trust before, and that's a good practice area for me to have. Be careful, because if you mess those up, the consequences are severe. You're talking about, you know, potentially millions of dollars of assets being included in someone's estate for tax purposes. Uh, and as you point out, Matt, you can develop the competence, but the the trick is realizing that the competence is required. And you know, you think of yourself as an estate planner, but maybe you're not an estate planner who's got experience with this particular mechanism. And that's where you've got to be careful, maybe to the point where you need to bring somebody else in to handle that particular piece, which is something admittedly we're loath to do. We don't like to give off work that we feel we can do, but it may be the prudent thing in the long run because the stakes can be very high. Well, we have a question from a, a viewer in the audience. Uh, the question is, do you have a duty to review divorce decrees for regular estate planning clients when you have not represented the other spouse at all? Well, I have in my engagement letter, which serves as a I don't call it a questionnaire, but I, I do have 10 or 15 questions in there. And it's one of them is, are either of you subject to any divorce decree or separation agreement? And I do think you need to review those. I don't, I, I think you have met your duty if the client says, no, I, I don't have anything or it doesn't apply. You might want to probe and say, are you sure? But if there's something out there, I think you need to read it because these are lay people and this was a divorce you know it's one of the most horrible experiences in their life and they may not see the ongoing obligation to make a bequest to somebody or or even sometimes it's to care, continue to carry life insurance that's pretty common but i think you need that as a piece of, of the picture yeah uh 
Brian, I, I think you mentioned earlier this morning, uh, estate planning, I think currently in this year, is number one in frequency for us, for claims? I, I think Matt was not throwing it to me because he was concerned about the dabbling and uh, practice issues if I spoke, but um, I appreciate you getting me involved, Tom. Uh, no, the uh, number one in terms of claim, Matt mentioned 26% this year of the claims are in the state planning by far number one, number two family law, which you talked about earlier. But even more striking is the, the we can call it severity, but it's just the amount of money either being spent on defense and or to settle claims in this area. Almost 30% of our indemnity dollars have been spent in the state trust probate. So not only are we seeing the claims, they're costing a lot of money, uh, both in terms of defense and by the way, just to get Bill off the hook, he was not being deposed. He was assisting an attorney who was being deposed. Um, but, not, uh, yet. <laughs> good, not yet. Not yet. Good, good, disti good distinction, right? <laughs> yeah, I thought we should. But um, so we're seeing the claim. We're, we are seeing the claims. And I think, I mean, one common theme when you drill down further, which I did to this area too, you're not going to see a claim when the estate transfers you have husband, wife, and child, and maybe an attorney made an error, but it goes to husband, wife, or child. I mean, that's, but what, so the, the your point, Tom, on the family dynamics is very relevant. And that is when you get a divorce or you get uh, stepchildren involved, uh, you get a charity maybe that, you know, isn't mom to, <laughs> or dad or son, uh, you get something different. I just think that as an attorney, that's when you have to put your guard up. Uh, not that the, obviously there's nothing wrong with this, but it does lead to a situation whereby you as the attorney can't correct some ill feelings that have developed for years and some real animosity towards mom, dad, or a new spouse or number three spouse or number four spouse. Obviously, I'm not saying don't do the work. They need, they need your assistance and your help. But those are situations where you want to be careful because there, there may be things that you, no matter what, child, someone who's disinherited, whatever the situation may be, just be cautious about that because it, it, uh, it could, could develop into a claim down the road. And, um, and Bill, I think the worry I, that I would, when I'm trying to crunch all these cases and figure out this inconsistency with regard to state plans, whether it be the will wasn't consistent with the trust or, um, or maybe there's a, the, the uh, client wanted the property or the estate to go to one person, but there's a real estate document that sends it to someone else. I don't know. It just, there's a worrisome thing when an attorney gets on in late in the game, uh, there's some inconsistencies that I don't know how that attorney can even address or, uh, make right but um they're they're subjecting themselves to a potential claim I, I, I don't know what advice maybe maybe that's too hard of a question bill but it just has led to claims and they're sometimes significant in value certainly the I, you know there's there's nothing the estate planner can do if after the fact the property that is supposed to fund a trust gets has a tod deed slapped on it that goes to somebody's new girlfriend or something like that. But boy, you can bet that people who didn't get that property through the trust are gonna be mad. And the current environment is, hey, let's take a shot at the lawyer who drafted this stuff. Uh, because right now I consider the area kind of unsettled and uh, it, I think the plaintiff's bar thinks that this is a kind of an easy shot. Um, the, what you're talking about is it's a recurrent theme. It is an information deficit. You've got to get information from your client. I, some clients or some attorneys will go so far as to say they just won't represent somebody unless they are doing everything. Uh, you know, they're doing all the beneficiary designations and everything else. That that's kind of an ideal, but a lot of clients will say, "I, I don't want to pay you to do that. I can do my own beneficiary designations." And that's their right. The key is you have to have the letter in the file that says, 
you are going to take care of designating the beneficiaries or retitling the real estate or something like that. Uh, I, I don't think the state of the law is that the lawyer has to see that it's done if the client has retained responsibility for that. But you better be able to show that there's no way that it was your responsibility. And even then, you, it's a good idea to ask, okay, if you're going to do it, can you send me a copy when you do it so that you've got it in the file? The client may not do that because do-it-yourselfers will go, I you know, don't need to do that, but you've at least tried. And, you know, and again, this goes back to the scope of the engagement. If you don't clearly carve out that retitling or trust funding, uh, the plaintiff's position is going to be that was your responsibility. And they will be able to find an expert that says, oh, no, nobody should do an estate plan unless they're doing all the document retitling and everything else. Again, I don't think that's the standard, but you better be able to document who's doing what. You know, Bill, you mentioned that, you know, the, the current environment is that disgruntled beneficiaries take a shot at, at the drafting attorney um, and that it, that it, it is unsettled. Um, what other theories are being pursued by disgruntled beneficiaries? I, I know that I have seen uh, theories of undue influence, which is a, a flavor of fraud. Um, what else is out there, um, you know, that, that we can at least raise some awareness to? Well, the, the standard is that a disappointed heir has a claim against the drafting attorney if they can show that the testator or trust settlor's clear intent is not accurately reflected in the documents. Well, you know, they had promised me I was going to get the house in Florida, and uh, it doesn't happen. That's that's potential for a claim, and now with the recent, I consider it an expansion, or at least something that needs to be reconciled. Uh, this obligation has extended to the administration of an estate. I don't even know how that works, but uh, heirs that can make a claim that an estate or trust was not administered in a way that's consistent with the clear intent of settlor or the testator have a claim under the law as it sits today. So, you know, anybody who's disappointed is, and the doc, when the documents don't line up, may feel like they've got a shot. And, and that, that's where we're at on this right now. It, it's very, there are a ton of problems with where the law is on this now that I'd be glad to go into. But the bottom line is that anytime Someone can show a disconnect between what they were told or sometimes, you know, it's a convenient memory uh, and what the documents that you drafted say makes you vulnerable. But I think that's just where we're at. It, Matt, you, remind, that you reminded me of the, when you said about the competency of the staff. One issue, and I know, Bill, you'll probably nod your head when I mention it, but lawyers try to be helpful and they'll get a call from maybe an aggrieved beneficiary, in, at least in quotes, and they they want to know about when dad came in, was he competent? Uh, what did you talk about? And that's very, very dangerous for the lawyer from an ethical standpoint in terms of violating the attorney-client privilege and um, may set you up for a, a claim or grievance, as mentioned, by trying to be helpful. So remember who your client is and who it isn't. And you can't, even though you're trying to explain something that may be beneficial to you in the document that is being questioned, you don't have carte blanche or, or do your, your staff to be giving information out about what happened and what the competency level and maybe what you talked about prior to entering into documents. Stop right there. Tell your staff to stop right there. You don't have the permission or authority to, be to, to even mention who your client was at that time. And sometimes it's at the deposition when the lawyer first says, wait a second, doesn't involve their carrier, may not talk to counsel. Are you looking at me possibly about a claim? Uh, don't walk yourself into that. Don't even mention 
you're going to breach the attorney client privilege trying to be helpful and it'll sort itself out down the road and i know it seems kind of harsh to say i really we, we can't offer that information we don't, we don't disclose to our clients or those type of things it's to your own protection and to the benefit and protection of your client we have a question from a viewer in the audience uh bill the question is if you ask that they provide copies of document titling after it has been done and they don't provide it are you then on the hook if you don't follow up to make sure that it has been done that's a fair question i i don't think so uh again as long as there's no question that it wasn't that you're just asking for record file copies as opposed to uh, something else. I, it, it's a valid point. I think you're better off trying to get that information. If nothing else, it's a prod for them to, to do it. Uh, you could take the position, well, it's, it's your responsibility. I'm not going to say anything about it further, just to avoid the possible idea that somehow you've assumed that obligation. But I think on balance, you're better off trying to get that information than that. But it, it is something of a judgment. And, um, you know, it's hard to know today what that's going to look like 10 years, but it's a good point. Yeah. Um, Bill, you talked a little bit about, you know, looking at estate planning documents that were drafted previously, maybe by another lawyer. Um, are you running into those circumstances more now uh, in the last year where you're asked to sort of, uh, I don't know, clean up some messes? Uh, uh, in, in estate planning documents? I just, my own unscientific sample, I'm not seeing that any more or less than I was before. Uh, okay. The drivers for that are, again, kind of life changes that COVID has led to some unfortunate events for people, but I don't know that the pandemic specifically has led to more of that. Okay. Matt, did you have? It looks like you had something to, to add here. No. Uh, no, okay. But uh, I did want to go back and, and talk about, uh, you know, Bill's phrase, not mine, the, the drive-by executions. Uh, that sounds horrible. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and may, maybe drive through uh, executions. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I have seen, or, or we have seen at Wilmick, um, some claims come through and, and it, it does present, uh, you know, different scenarios under which lawyers tried to get the job done um, and, you know, it didn't work. Um, so I, I, I thought that the, the drive-through uh, signings was uh, something that was creative, but also made lawyers uh, sort of appreciate the situation that they were in. Um, and recognize the need for perhaps more thorough preparation prior to the actual signing of the documents, which I appreciated. And I thought that was that would be useful, a uh, useful development, uh, especially in terms of client communication. Um, we see, um, you know, uh, most, I know it's not most, but um, you know, a very high number of, of claims come across our desks that involve client communication. So that anything that that uh, elevates the level of client communication, in my opinion, is a good thing. Um, so let me try to illustrate that. Uh, the lawyer who first brought up the idea of drive-through signings to me explained that he wanted to make sure that he answered every single question that the client might have before he actually brought them in for this drive-through signing. And I thought that was great. Um, not just because uh, that's what a lawyer should do, but also because it had a pause. It had a natural pause in it where, uh, you know, it, instead of the client coming in and having a meeting to explain everything and then signing the document, there was the, the meeting, which either occurred by Zoom or by phone or, or in some other way, just to sort of preserve that social distancing. Um, and, and then there was that pause between that particular meeting where everything was explained and then, you know, the scheduled drive by or drive, drive through uh, signing. During that time, much like when you are at a doctor's visit um, and you're in the middle of the appointment, you don't think of everything that you want to think of to ask the doctor at the time. Um, you have that natural pause between the meeting and the signing 
uh, to be able to develop those questions to sort of digest the you know everything that you've been told because it is complex. It is something that is different, um, you know, to the layperson. Um, and so they probably ought to have the time to go home and Google everything that the lawyer said, you know, so that they can try to formulate some of the questions that need to be asked. Um, so to that extent, you know, I appreciate that sort of creative solution. Um, I don't know that the drive-through signing is ideal, um, but if it leads to that sort of development of, uh, you know, enhanced or, or improved client communication, I think that's a good thing. Um, on the other hand, um, there have been um, situations that that's, that's one, you know, I think benefit uh, or silver lining, if you will. Um, I, I think in other circumstances, attorneys rush um, and perhaps take whatever solution they can come up with in the moment. Um, and that, you know, goes against client communication it, it, and it goes against, you know, all of the formalities required to make, uh, you know, the estate planning documents uh, valid and enforceable. Um, for example, um, when uh, one particular uh, policyholder of ours uh, showed up at a, uh, I, I can't remember if it was an actual hospital um, or uh, an assisted living facility, somewhere where they were restricting the number of visitors that could go in. Lori's usual practice was to go in and to bring with uh, him, you know, adequate witnesses, um, you know, to uh, have the document signed and witnessed properly. Um, they were only allowing one person in. Um, and so the lawyer went in and grabbed a nurse, um, you know, who was there um, and, and didn't fully execute the document in the manner it needed to be executed. Um, he could have drafted it a different way, he said. Um, but ultimately, uh, it just wasn't done uh, the way it was supposed to be done. But he did what he could, you know, in the moment. Um, so comments uh, that you might have, um, advice in those situations where you feel pressured to get the job done, uh, but maybe don't have the ideal circumstances to do it correctly. Uh, this, this is why, you know, if you can't stand the heat, <laughs> get out of the kitchen. I mean, state planning... Is, is an area of risk because there's there's the ideal and then there are your client's actual situations. And the ideal setup is to have two witnesses and a notary that are completely unrelated and everything else. Well, what if you've got a situation like that where access restricted is restricted and the client's dying? Let's, let's assume they still have capacity is not an issue. But you know, one thing that you can be darn sure of is if the client expires before you get the will signed, someone's going to call you into question. That That's the reality. And sometimes we do things that are less than ideal uh, because the this, this situation is exigent. I would argue that you've got to act in your client's best interest based on reality and not what some somebody who's a hired expert says is the ideal way to sign a document. Uh, but it's it's a balancing act. I mean, it may be where you say, sorry, we just can't do this today. Uh, that That is not risk-free either. I mean, we have defended cases where that sort of thing happened. And sure enough, the person didn't make it through the night. And the family's saying, this is your fault. Maybe it's not. But that's a balance that that you have to strike. And this leads to a, a practical point I just want to mention quickly. Your, as an attorney, and your involvement in the document signing, I submit, changes completely when you go from either just presiding over the meeting and maybe notarizing the signature of a testator and witnesses to becoming one of the signing witnesses. Uh, it's, you know, we could walk through the rules about confidentiality and privilege, which are two separate considerations. But um, once you decide that it's necessary for you to be a witness, you are subjecting yourself to being a witness about the signing of that document to an extent that maybe you wouldn't if you don't become one of the signing one of the witnesses. And again, maybe maybe there is no choice, but 
And if you consciously make that decision, I, I think we can defend it. But it's not one to be undertaken lightly. Challenges of document signing uh, seem to me could could grow. Uh, they're not. I don't think they're going away. We've got rising cases due to the variant, and so and and we have you know nursing facilities and and skilled care nursing facilities that are back to you know uh, restricting visitors and that sort of thing. So I I'm guessing these challenges for estate planning lawyers and and their clients are is not going away. Uh, you guys agree? Are going away. Oh, yeah. I think it's good to circle back to the statute of limitations that Matt talked about earlier and what came up in the family law. That you're asked to do something at a moment's notice that puts you on the hook for years to come. Back to Bill's point, well, be cautious about what you enter into. And is this one that you think you can competently handle for a, sometimes a small fee with a huge exposure? That's just something you have to, I can't answer the question, but just understand the risk. And the other thing I wanted to talk about, Bill, in reverse, because I know we've had at least at least the one claim like this, is where you put together the documents and then they go out to the client and you never hear from them, see them again. What, how do you, how do you uh, kind of button that up and end the representation when the, you never had the execution or for Maybe it was executed outside of your presence. You don't know what happened, but uh, so you're not just sitting there holding the bag for you forever after as an attorney. Yeah, I, I think there the best you can do is a noisy exit. Uh, you know, I, I drafted these documents for you and sent them to you on date X. You know, and some clients aren't above signing your drafts. So, uh, we have had, I've talked to practitioners who've run into this, that people think they're you know, going to skip out on a fee or, or save some money. If, yeah, this is good enough, I'll sign it. Um, that's not, you know, what you need in the situation you described is a letter that says, I sent you these documents. They were drafts. You know, I told you they were drafts. We still had some unresolved issues. I have not heard from you. If I do not hear from you by date X, I'm going to terminate our engagement. And you don't need court authorization because you're not in court. Uh, I'm going to terminate our representation and I disclaim any responsibility for those documents or their execution. I think you've got to be that explicit and send that and maybe you send it certified and maybe you send it by mail and email so that when the time comes and, you know, somebody signed your draft that wasn't quite right, you can say, well, that wasn't meant to be signed. And here I am telling you that it wasn't. That's that's as much as you can do. You should not. We all have the hope that the stray lambs will come back. And if you have an estate planning practice, you've seen it. A, a couple of years later, people will come back and say, "I'm ready to sign those documents now." Well, that's that's a series of other issues, but uh, it's it's a judgment call as to how long you're willing to leave that stuff hanging out there and what you should do, as as Brian points out, to make sure that you're not responsible for what happened to those documents after you lost contact with it. I, I'm gonna steal that phrase, Bill. I like it, make a noisy exit. Uh, it's, a, <laughs> it's a very good IAY letter in my opinion. Uh, I wanna circle back to one of the issues that Tom brought up and that was, you know, what is the current state of, you know, uh, you know, formal execution of estate planning documents, which is much different than the real estate world, which seems to have made leaps and bounds in you know being able to do things uh, remotely and, and electronically. Uh, and I understand from the materials that you provided that uh, in May of last year, Supreme Court said, no, we're not gonna change the formal requirements for estate planning documents, but um, there are still some forces at work. What, uh, what do you know? Well, all I know is that a, the Supreme Court said, no, we can't really develop a position on this without having a case in front of us. Isn't that a reassuring thought? Um, so there, there's no help there. But there is this committee, and I uh, it included my materials and email from the head of it, that is, it's actually still at the investigation phase. I, I don't know that there's a clear consensus on what electronic witnessing or execution of estate planning documents is. I mean, we could end up in a place where electronic signatures will work for some things, but we are not there yet. Um, and in fact, I think we may be a long way from that. There was also, I didn't mention it in my materials, but I believe I found 
a bill that didn't get anywhere in this last legislative session trying to allow remote notarization of estate planning documents. And that's, that doesn't, even if that would have gotten somewhere, that doesn't address a lot of the issues we've got, but we don't even have that. I mean, there is nothing that's changed in the last 400 years with estate planning about needing, you know, conscious presence and signatures and witnesses. That, that stuff hasn't changed. It hasn't evolved a bit. And until it does, we, we can't use it for these purposes, even though, and, and this is something, you know, if you practice in other areas, as you say, you're doing real estate stuff where nobody touches any paper anymore. And that stuff's all completely enforceable. Um, but in the estate planning realm, it doesn't fly. Bill, you mentioned uh, in your initial remarks uh, 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 limiting the scope of representation um, or, or just scope of representation generally. And, and I've certainly, uh, I've had the occasion to speak over the years about limited scope representation and what that means and, and what are the implications there. And I, I think it's worth digging a little deeper. Uh, I want to get your thoughts on um, the dangers of it. I think it's certainly out there. It, it's become more prevalent than it ever was years back. Um, so, you know, what I have found is, and, and maybe Brian and Matt, you guys can certainly discuss what you've seen in claims, but the, you know, the, the lawyer doesn't, it is not clear about what, that scope is. And so the lines get blurred and the client starts thinking that they're representing them on all kinds of things when the lawyer is under the assumption or believes that he or she is only performing a certain uh, part of the representation. Uh, you see that in estate planning and what are the, what are the pros and cons of that? I, I think there's some benefits to, to limited scope representation for the lawyer and the client, but uh, there are some, some pitfalls too, correct? I don't want to cut anybody off. I'll, I'll just jump in here with, with one point. As attorneys, we have threshold responsibility to determine for the client, this is a substituted judgment thing that you can take issue with if you believe in liberty of contract, but you can't even ask a client to agree to a limited representation, a limited scope of representation, unless it's reasonable to do so. Now there's a standard that will keep you up at night. And in complex estate planning, you know, is it a fair ask? That's, that's something the lawyer has to decide before they even undertake something under a limited scope. Yeah, and I was gonna add that the problem uh, that we've seen is where the lawyer doesn't even re recognize that they are limited in their scope of the entire estate plan. They get in late and do a simple document, I put in quotes, not recognizing the entire, what how that was inconsistent with other documents or estate planning uh, materials that are in place. So uh, <laughs> it's, it's limited scope that the lawyer doesn't even recognize the, how limited they are in the grand scheme of things. And <clears throat> that's just the danger of jumping in late, especially with a complex estate, much more, um, I don't know, Bill, we've seen one that there's much more involved with the estate than the lawyer ever dreamed, and including the value thereof. And <clears throat> it's just an area that I, I would just say it's a very risky area to one dabble in, but two, try to argue that you were limited, therefore had no obligation to investigate other assets and how the uh, estate was to be dis dispersed when your document does something that's to entirely different or inconsistent with what maybe the client thought was going to happen with that limited involvement late. I think one of the ways we can answer that is to, is to take a look at the rules and, uh, you know, and what they um, uh, prohibit or require uh, and as Bill mentions, you know, you, you know, and this may be different than the, the you know, establishing a legal malpractice claim, but uh, Supreme Court Rule 20 colon 1.2, um, as, as Bill points out, a, lo a lawyer may limit the scope of representation if the limitation is reasonable. 
uh, as, as Bill mentioned, under the circumstances and the client gives informed consent. Uh, I won't read it again, um, but uh, we talked about informed consent, you know, earlier in the program and it's, it, it requires a lot, you know, and it requires a, a fairly comprehensive, if not comprehensive, um, uh, well, it does. It, it requires a comprehensive review of, you know, what is available, what the alternatives are, uh, and and giving all of that information to the client um, before they make any decision about a particular course of conduct. And what I'm reading uh, is that includes, um, you know, the scope of representation. So if you, lawyer, are going to limit the scope of representation, you need to make sure that you communicate all things relative to limiting the scope, including what alternatives the client might have. Uh, and you have to get informed consent. Um, and I don't know off the top of my head uh, if informed consent includes meaning uh, that you get it in writing. Um, but uh, best practice would certainly dictate that that's what happens. Um, so communicate, write the letter, get the client to understand and acknowledge the understanding and the client to make the choice. I think it, I think it's, isn't the threshold, uh, if it's a thousand dollars, if the, if the representation is your fees are a thousand dollars or more, you have to put it in writing, but I, I always suggest do it anyway. Yeah. The, yeah. And I was talking about in writing, whether informed consent, you know, the consent yeah. actually needs to come from the client in writing. I don't know that, um, but it's certainly required anytime you limit the scope of representation, I think is what the rule says whether it's more than a thousand or less than a thousand, if you're going to limit scope of representation, you've got to get that in writing. There's an existing client exception to the written or to the informed consent requirement, which is a real trap mm. because those are exactly the clients that will say, you know, I just want you to write a codicil changing the alter, the alternate successor trustee. Well, you know, maybe that's all it is. But if you don't say this is all I'm doing and I'm not reviewing your plan again or something like that, if there are dominoes that fall because of that, it could be a problem down the road. So I would recommend getting it ready. And you, these days you can do it. You can say, you know, and if you agree with this, just send me a reply email that you agree. And I think that meets the written requirement. And there's no substitute for having the client, having evidence the client not only saw it, but said, yes, I agree. So when Bill is deposed down the road, he can pull out that letter. And say, I sure hope I can find it. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, the old um, the risk, Bill, of the just a simple well, that's all I need, just the one change at the end, and you haven't reviewed anything to include their financial circumstances. Whether or not you have a good letter or not, just know that you may be subject to a claim. And is that something you for the two hundred dollars you received or something? Is that something you want to be, get yourself involved with? It, as I say, I, I, I've been amazed uh, from this sitting in this chair, where people the, the uh, as has a, as have our lawyers about how big some of these estates are for a gentleman who shows up wearing jeans and a torn T-shirt, and a, <laughs> and they, they have millions and millions of dollars involved. Yes. So I, yeah, yeah, that's true. And I'm not talking about Matt either, by the way. Uh -oh. <laughs> not going to stand up. <laughs> the, 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 the torn T-shirt or the millions of dollars? Yeah. Which one? <laughs> the both. Yeah. But the, the back, and and Bill, I liked your. I hope everyone had a chance to read the, that article you included with from Tim Pierce's idea about. Uh, well, I guess it was entitled "The State Planning Clients of Divorce and Potential Conflicts." Just because you can do something ethically doesn't mean you should do something or that you will avoid a claim down the road. And anytime you take a, an action that's adverse to a former client, whether or not it's ethical or not, you may be subjected to a claim. And uh, Bill, I think you would uh, agree to me as of yesterday, sitting through that excruciatingly long deposition, if you can avoid being the subject, subject of a claim, you'll be much happier down the road whenever that happens, whether or not you think I, I just want to caution. I, I thought Tim's was, it was a really good article, but I, what I could foresee is that adverse party who was formerly your client, whether or not you could ethically take on that representation saying, hey, I thought you were my client. Now you're disinheriting me, bringing a lawsuit or a claim against that 
attorney. And it's just not where you want to be. Yeah, I, I think that claim would be a loser. But as you say, that doesn't matter because your life is going to be disrupted by that claim. And it it's it's no fun. And it, it's expensive. This, this is time you cannot spend practicing law. When you're preparing for deposition, responding to discovery, and being deposed, that's all lost time. And, and it hurts. Brian, Matt, any other issues uh, that you guys are seeing in this area of practice that we haven't touched on or that, that you need, think needs to be emphasized a little bit? I, I know, you know that the, it's, it's the number one area in terms of frequency th th this year. So I, I, I'm guessing you guys are, are seeing all kinds of things. Yeah, one thing I, I brought up to Bill right before we started today, and I, I think it might be helpful for him being that he's out practicing. It, it, it seems to me that there are more complicated estate planning issues, and some of them fall right back to the fact that there seem to be issues with trusts, whether it be revo revocable living trusts or revocable trusts. But um, I, I asked Bill, is that something that's becoming more common, or are we just seeing that in that there are larger estates with more money passing? That are, are creating these problems, but the trust issue in uh, legal mail claims. Yeah, I, you know, I. After we talked, I was thinking. I don't know if it's just because I'm I'm getting older and my clients are getting more affluent, but there's no doubt. I've been. I started in 1985. That's privileged information for everybody on this call. Um, and the ratio of will-based plans to revocable trust-based plans has has flipped in that time. Um, I would say in my practice, the revocable trust is almost a default. Uh, and they're great. And there's a reason for that. You know, you avoid probate. It's the best disability planning mechanism around. Uh, you can go on and on, but they are more complex. And uh, that can lead to potential problems. I, I have any revocable trust that I'm using an estate planning is executed using the same formalities as a will. I think that's just sound practice. Um, I don't know that that's necessarily legally required, but I don't want to be the test case for that. But yeah, a, a trust is more complex and it's more expensive. And that's something you should tell your clients in the front end that they're going to spend money on this. And the other aspect of it is funding. Got to be absolutely clear with your client who's going to be responsible for retitling real estate and things like that. I can't emphasize that enough because that that is where these revocable trust-based plans fall down, and that's where people get unhappy. Bill, we have a question from a viewer in the audience. The question is: What type of documentation do you recommend when the clients insist that they want you and not their children to act as personal representatives or as successor trustees? Honestly, I won't do it um, unless it's a, maybe in a family situation, I would do it or for a friend. I, and I'm not saying it's inappropriate. There are situations where family lawyer is a good person for that, but This isn't something that people are going to want to hear, but my preference when I put the malpractice defense hat on is to say, client, I, I'm touched and I'm not only going to write you a letter that says you asked me to do this without me initiating it, but I want you to go and see another lawyer and talk with them before you sign the document that puts me in this position. That I think to avoid you know, the undue influence and the solicitation risks. And I, I think you ought to do that. Clients hate hearing that, but to protect yourself, I think that's the best course. I mean, I, I think you can draft the document, although I know people who have said, fine, if you want me as trustee, have someone else draft it. I, I did that in a particularly situation that I knew was going to be an issue. Uh, I don't know if you have to go that far, but having separate representation for that particular issue is great insurance. And it's pretty extreme, I admit. 
You mentioned, Bill, in your outline, um, you know, ethical duties. And I, I know, Matt, you've touched on some of the rules as well here. Um, any any uh, general comments you want to make, Bill? We're, we're running up close to the 75 minutes now, but I, I wanted to get your take on, you know, your thoughts on, on ethical duties and, and the things lawyers should be aware of uh, as they as they forge ahead in this in this area. Yeah, I, yeah. And Bill, before you answer, throw on to, I'm going to piggyback on the Toms. Greg brought up videotaping in the family law context. I just want to, that, that comes up, that comes up in this area too. So uh, with regard to competency and, and uh, protection of the lawyer and or the, the document on the video. Yeah, let's take um, that up. Yeah, let's take that up now. Take that up first. Go ahead, Bill. I have not been a fan of that because uh, once you put someone in front of a video camera, you, you, things may happen that you may not like. Uh, and, you know, I don't think you can undo those. It, the worst case you'd be in is to say, you know, well, counselor, did, did you videotape the signing of these documents? Uh, yeah, we did, but we destroyed the video because we decided it wasn't done quite right. We're going to do it again. Uh, that said, it, it's hard to argue with video evidence of your going through with the client that they clearly understand what the document does for them and that they want to sign it and, you know, they seem oriented and understand who their errors are. It, it may be coming to that. I, I don't think it's a complete solution for everything and I'm not sure it's appropriate in all situations, but I, it may just be an age-based bias because I've been doing it for so long, but it may be coming. And in some contexts, it may be the right move. Okay. Oh, so on that part. And then segueing to the ethical part. Yeah. It, it goes back to beating the drum. <laughs> As lawyers, we owe an undivided duty of loyalty to the client. And that is increasingly difficult when we're all worried about people's issue suing. It's one of the problems with the current state of, of Wisconsin law. But it goes back to my first thing, identify your client and a lot of your problems will go away. And then realize that your duty of loyalty to that client is undivided. Uh, it's You've got, it's a contractual relationship, but it is also by law a fiduciary relationship where you have to act completely in the best interest of that client. That's as simple and as hard as it sounds. And that's, that's really your guidepost. All the rest of this is sort of, you know, muscle on the bones of your duty of undivided loyalty to act in the best and exclusive interest of your client. Hey, Bill, you made that made me think of one thing that's come up over the years is how, when you're paid by your bill is paid by not your client but a beneficiary and maybe one that wouldn't normally take in due course. Is that something that ethically, uh, as a lawyer, is allowable, or would that would that give you concern in in that circumstance to uh, handle that matter with that type of payment? There is a rule on that question of having your fees paid by someone other than your client. And uh, there's exclusion for insurance companies, but um, it can be done with informed consent, but I don't, I don't even go there. If somebody says, oh, my dad's gonna pay for my estate planning. I say, that's great. I'll be sending you the bill and you can get dad pay the bill if you want. But I, I don't usually, agree to those arrangements just because it's fraught. And you can easily avoid it by saying, no, you're my client. I'm going to bill you. Where you get the money is your business. That's the way I look at it. It may be a little short-sighted, but I think it's the best way to do it. Bill, back back to you, circling back to your, uh, your response about uh, when clients insist uh, that they want you as, uh, as personal rep or, or successor trustee, a comment from a viewer. She likes her answer. Uh, it's best for the attorney in, in the minds of this viewer, uh, uh, best for the attorney to uh, not be named a successor trustee 
why not tell the clients to consider having their local bank uh, and, and trust as the successor or trustee? Bank trust departments are an institution. Unlike family members, they never die and will be around to handle all the trust responsibilities with family members, charities, et cetera. That, that certainly is my default recommendation. Unless someone's got an individual who is really right for the job and, you know, and a bank or trust company is often the best choice, but not always. I uh, particularly, I get unfortunately more and more situations where someone's got a child who's uh, an addict or has other problems, and I say, you know, banks and trust companies are really good. They people will reject that idea because they don't think an institution can handle. Uh, what's usually a discretionary trust situation and deal appropriately with this impaired child. So I, my default personally is, is institutions, but I'm receptive to ideas that someone other than an institution may be the appropriate trustee for certain trusts. Okay. Well, we're, uh, we're in the wrap up uh, period now as we we've, we've crossed over past the 75 minutes. Uh, I would encourage viewers if you have any other questions or comments, Submit them now um, so I can get them before we sign off. And in the meantime, um, I'll throw it to Matt and Brian first, and, and then you, Bill. Um, some closing thoughts from you guys uh, for takeaways for our, our audience. Matt, I'll start with you. Sure. I, I think uh, one area we didn't really get into, and I don't know that our statistics uh, uh, make this distinction, um, but uh, we include in our claims count, you know, grievances filed with OLR. Um, and I think anytime you uh, delve into as many ethical rules that apply to a practice area, that is always a risk. Um, and so uh, my, my guess is that a fair number of the, the, the claims that have been made uh, against our policyholders, at least as far as our numbers reflect, a fair number of those are probably grievances. Um, and we're in a, an area that involves family um, and money and family. And so there are emotions involved. Um, and uh, oftentimes when there isn't uh, an attorney-client relationship and there isn't a very hopeful uh, legal theory to pursue a legal malpractice game, claim against a lawyer, um, you know, people will turn to OLR um, seeking, if nothing else, you know, the ability to vent um, or, or, you know, do something to address the situation to help them. Um, so that happens. Uh, Wilmick, um, of course, offers uh, you know, some additional benefits. If that happens to you, if there is a grievance filed, please get in touch with us uh, and we can uh, find someone to assist. Um, but uh, those things do happen. And uh, in OLR, they don't have to demonstrate causation and damages where that is an essential element to any malpractice claim. It's not uh, to establish uh, um, uh, running afoul of the ethical rules. So be aware and uh, and obviously give Brian or me a call uh, and we'll we'll help you through those processes. Brian, over to you. Agree. And uh, I mean, our stat statistics are what they are. It's not, this is the number one area of claims and the most expensive area. So you're, it's a risky area to practice in. Uh, make sure you report any concerns and Bill can, on the final wrap up, say that we've had times where a lawyer will call and they're just, they're concerned about what can I disclose or what should I do? And it doesn't have to be a claim yet. And please call us and we'll put you in touch with someone like Bill uh, or other practitioners in that area that will help guide you through and hopefully avoid a claim, which Bill would just mention. If you can avoid a claim in the first place, your your money and time long ahead than having struggled to struggle through. And then I think the final area is that and Matt's statistics showed it not a good area to dabble in a state trust probate. One, it's it's frequently a claim area, but two, very complicated and, and family dynamics, uh, financial issues can cause claims that you might not see in other areas of practice. So. If you do go into this, be careful. And um, if you do have a problem, please let us know because we can help get you to someone to help guide you through the process. I'll dovetail off what Brian talked about. I, from experience, 
Boomlock offers this valuable service of helping you before a claim is even made. Uh, one phenomenon that you should be aware of is if you find a potential problem, a lot of very good attorneys who are very conscientious will immediately think it's the problem is their fault. It is helpful to talk to Wilmick, and if they think it's appropriate to talk to a, another practitioner, because often as not, it's not your fault. And even if it may be your fault, there are things within the ethical rules that you maybe don't want to be saying to your client right away while the situation is still reparable. So getting, you know, biting the bullet and saying, I, I guess I better call Wilmick because I think there's a potential situation here. The sooner you do that, the better uh, before you maybe say something that will be very hard to undo. Um, and another pair of eyes on something may well show that you didn't do anything wrong. And uh, that, that's a good spot to be, but don't impair it by trying to be a good guy and falling on your sword because it may not be necessary or appropriate. Uh, Bill, we did have a question come in here uh, regarding comments about uh, when clients pass the bill along to somebody else to pay. Uh, the comment from the viewer is if the bill is very, they, they do that, um, but they said if the bill is very detailed, then the non-client is getting every detail. Are there ways to resolve that? That's a good point. And one that I should have mentioned, if you're aware, I mean, it's the client's information to disclose. And there is attorney-client waiver issue there. If you're aware that someone else might be getting the bill, uh, just get your client's consent that, or inform them at least that, you know, the bill is attorney client information. And if you disclose it, you could be waiving privilege. Right? And, and I'd put that in writing, um, you know, and maybe mom or dad don't need to see the bill. Uh, maybe they just need to know what the amount is. And because of that attorney client privilege issue. Okay. All right. Uh, well, listen, um, that's uh, pretty much all the time we have. We, I've got a couple of comments here uh, that are coming in from viewers thanking us and thanking all of you guys for the program. Um, comments about a very interesting, outstanding program. Materials very interesting and helpful. So um, thank you from all of you who are, are sending in those comments. We very much appreciate it. Um, you'll all get a, an email evaluation form uh, with, with some questions. And, and part of that evaluation will include suggestions for topics for the future. And we always like to see that because we want to bring topics to you that, that you find pertinent and, and uh, helpful to your practice. So you'll be seeing that. And uh, thank you all for joining us this morning. Uh, very much appreciated. Um, Bill, Brian, Matt, thanks for, for your time and expertise. Uh, always great uh, to get to drill down and get into these topics. So uh, again, to, the, to all of you guys, uh, thanks so much. Very much appreciated. And to the viewers, thanks for joining us. This is a, a three ethics credit that, that has been approved. Um, and just a reminder, when you do uh, end up uh, at the time when you submit your um, uh, uh, reporting uh, to the Board of Bar Examiners, you when you go online, you'll see the button that says uh, live webcast. That's the button you want. Um, and in that, in, in that section, you will find this program listed. So it's been approved for three credits, so uh, you're all good there. Uh, if you have any questions about it, you certainly can contact us. Uh, Stephanie Williams or, or I can certainly help you with those things. So um, thanks again for joining us. Uh, Bill, Brian, and Matt, thank you. Everybody have a great weekend. And we will be back with our uh, fall slash winter seminar uh, later this year before the year is over. So stay tuned for details uh, on all of that as well. Uh, so thank you very much. Have a great weekend. Bye, everybody. Thanks.